afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all again. Uh, meeting three of the St. Louis Products Working Group. Um, so I just wanted to check in as we get started to see if anyone has any uh, requests, sort of new business that you want to put into our agenda for discussion today. Otherwise, we'll launch into what we have and we'll have a chance uh, later in the meeting to get into discussions. We'll have time for discussion later. And so we have, if you could introduce yourself to the group since we know you're not getting holiday. <laughs> I am very first for substitute. I'm Sarah Reeves. I'm the executive director for Chicken Salaway's district sitting in for Jennifer Holiday. Right. Well, and thank you for okay. The full cast is here. So let's get um, started. Um, when we last uh, talked, one of the things we, we had an introduction last meeting on uh, producer, extended producer responsibility and uh, related to packaging. And uh, mm -hmm. this meeting, one of the things that we, I think as a group, agreed we wanted to do was start to hear from the front lines, like who's doing this, what kind of work are they going through, how is it happening, and that includes both um, at the uh, manufacturer level as well as at the solid waste level and also hearing from our colleagues over in Maine that are working on a, a similar initiative. So with that, I'd like to invite Martin Wolf to join us at the table. I don't know if, if uh, in terms of a preamble, if there's any other questions you have for us before you get started, but uh, EPR and packaging and, and in particular uh, plastic packaging, which is 50% of all packaging, uh, is one of the oh, plastic waste. I mean, is one of the things we're interested in seeing how you all address that and uh, learn some lessons from the front line. Okay, very good. I'll try to answer that question. Uh, I'll, I'll begin, if I may, with a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Martin Wolf. I'm the Director of Sustainability and Authenticity for 7th Generation. And in that capacity, it is my job to design frameworks uh, for product design, how we conduct our business, and for uh, looking at and trying to influence the way commerce is conducted so that we can create a more sustainable uh, system of, of commerce. Seventh Generation was founded in 1988 here in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, we now employ over 150 people and we distribute products through natural food stores, through uh, supermarkets, uh, mass uh, merchants and online across the United States and in over 20 countries around the world. In 2016, we were acquired by Unilever uh, uh, LTD and uh, are uh, independently incorporated but wholly owned by Unilever. Unilever has as its mission to make sustainable living commonplace. So there's great compatibility between uh, Unilever and seventh generation. And we manufacture laundry detergents, dish detergents, uh, hand soaps, recycled household paper products, baby diapers, baby wipes, and period care products, all of which are packaged either in plastic or in uh, typically recycled box board materials. Before launching into a discussion of uh, some of the things we think need to be done to improve management of single-use products and packaging, I'd like to raise our vision to an overarching consideration, which is that of sustainability. Sustainability is defined by the United Nations Commission on Sustainable Development as meeting today's needs without diminishing the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And to achieve this goal of sustainability, it is necessary that the resources we have available to us today be available to future generations. And when we think about single-use products or any use of materials or energy, I think we need to think about that broader framework 
so that we don't take small steps that diminish our ability to sustain our economy, but take steps that are always consistent with that objective. The current economic model, as you know, of extraction, production, distribution, use, and disposal is not sustainable. Resources are finite, both in supply, but also in disposal, not just in terms of filling up landfills, but also filling our atmosphere with carbon dioxide to the point we're actually changing uh, the climate on Earth or depositing materials in our oceans to the detriment of life there and ultimately to our own detriment. So, simply put, we cannot continue to do what we are doing in a linear economy if we're to create a sustainable economy and more to the focus of this meeting if we're to uh, meet the five objectives set forth for this working group. What we must do to meet those five objectives is to look at a transition away from a linear an unsustainable economy to one that is a circular economy, where there is no concept of waste. So uh, to give an example of that, if I may, I will ask you to think about how old you are. And you don't have to answer that out loud. But then I want you to think about something you are made of. For example, water. I think is roughly 80% of the composition of our bodies, or the carbon or the calcium in your bones, and ask you, how old are each of those materials? <laughs> so if you answered you were 20 years old, or 30 years old, or 40 years old, whatever, think again, because you're not. You're somewhere between 7 and 11 billion years old. So if you felt tired, <laughs> there may have been a reason for that. But, uh, and I know some of my friends, and I'll use that word loosely, have said I'm as old as dirt, and I say exactly. <laughs> uh, so how does that relate to what we are discussing today? Well, it's an example of a system that is circular, where water created before the Earth was formed, seven billion years ago, condensed onto this planet and was used by life four billion years ago, was used by dinosaurs 150 million years ago, was used by our forefathers, our founding fathers, used by plants, by who knows what, before it came to us. And we have to think about using the resources of this planet in the same way, in a circular way. So I hope I've made that point. So a circular economy consists of extraction, production, distribution, and use, just like a linear economy. But then rather than think of disposal, think about reutilization. How do we get that material back? So we can use it, and future generations can use it. Nature has shown us models in which there is no waste. The output of every insect, every animal, including us, is an input to some other system in nature. And we need to think about how, after we use what we call a single-use material, it is recovered for reuse rather than discarded. Reutilization means that every product or package is either reused, like a stainless steel water bottle, I'm pleased to see that uh, in front of your desk, Senator uh, Bray, or it is recycled, like a pet drinking water bottle, or if the material is bio-based, it can compost and go back to being inputs into bio-based systems. This does not mean we lose the convenience and utility of using a package or a product once, 
Rather, it means we create incentives and infrastructure and make sure they're in place so that every package or product is recovered after use and reutilized. How do we do that in Vermont? It will require actions by government, businesses, including materials manufacturers, product manufacturers such as seventh generation, retailers, and restaurants. And it will require effort by our citizens. And hopefully, I can provide you some insights and recommendations that will help you lead us to this circular economy. First and foremost, I think it's imperative that the legislature establish policies and requirements for reutilization of all materials sold into commerce in Vermont. We should not bring things into the state that are intended to be discarded after a single use. Everything should be designed with a future use in mind. Further, we should make sure that these requirements and policies are uniform across the state. So a citizen in Burlington follows the same rules and has the same understanding about what can be recycled in Barry, who has the same understanding of what can be recycled uh, as a citizen in Bennington. And if possible, we should look to other states. I did hear that someone from Maine is here. Uh, and work with them to make sure that policies are also uniform from state to state. That will help businesses conduct their, uh, conduct their commerce in a way that is more sustainable and easier to manage, significantly more easy to manage, as well as reducing confusion on the part of consumers about what can be recycled, what can't be recycled, et cetera. We should make recycling easy. Right now, it is a confusing mess. Consider, for example, requiring a bold, easily readable marking on recyclable plastics. What if there was a blue uh, square or stripe on every recyclable plastic bottle so that consumers had a visual cue that this should go into a blue bin. What if plastics that were not readily recyclable had a yellow stripe and there was a corresponding yellow bin for more difficult to recycle plastics like number four, five, six that are not readily recyclable? What sounds like you've uh, seen me over at my kitchen window putting things up and lighting them and turning them around, trying to see what symbols on them are not on them. Exactly. I do the same thing. And it is frustrating uh, because uh, sometimes I have to pull out a magnifying glass to see that it's so small. Uh, and it shouldn't be that hard. You should have a visual cue to guide you. Same thing with compostable materials. What if we had a green stripe to indicate that a cup that looks just like a number one plastic but is a number seven PLA compostable plastic had a green stripe on it so that you would put it in the proper composting bin? I know I've gone to uh, the grocery and I've gotten green plastic bags to put vegetables in that were compostable, which is great because I use them to line my compost bin in my kitchen. But I've also been to the grocery and had a green plastic bag that was a number four recyclable that would not compost. Well, what if one was green and the other was tinted a slight blue color instead of the green color? So you knew which was compostable and which was recyclable. And this could be extended to other materials like plastic films, where you have a white stripe that could be recycled, etc. Make recycling easy. Make those numbers legible or get away from the numbers. One thing that's always amazed me, we have um, very clever scientists who can create dozens of different types of plastics that have tremendous utility, and yet they can't count above seven. It just doesn't compute for me uh, for some reason. Can I ask you a quick question on the stripe and uh, obvious symbols kind of thing? 
who's leading a dis I mean, I would seem like Vermont wouldn't be able to do such a thing on its own because so many materials arrive here from some other place. So is there a national conversation going on that's organized around adopting a symbol system like you're talking about? So about a decade ago, the American Society for Testing Materials, ASTM, established a committee for plastics resin identification codes, and the plastics industry has stymied their work for over 10 years. They don't want materials to be recycled because it is not part of their current business model. I'm hoping that is changing. But I think working with large users like Coca-Cola, beverage industry, manufacturers, uh, we're very small as seventh generation, but possibly as you know, and with industry associations uh, like the Society of the Plastics Industry, maybe we can get a common sense, practical system in place. Thank you. Another issue is maintaining the value of recyclables. Uh, one common complaint we hear is that uh, recycled plastics have very little value. That's not entirely true. If you have a pure plastic stream, like a relatively pure number one PET stream or a relatively pure number two stream, they have tremendous value. In fact, seventh generation pays slightly more for its number two uh, recycled resin than we would if we were buying virgin resin. The recycled material has more value because it's in high demand. What goes, or used to go to China that gets rejected is mixed plastics. Once you mix things together, if you're going to recycle them, you have to unmix them. Mixing them together doesn't make sense. Uh, there's a rule of nature, a law of nature called entropy working against you. Uh, so keep the plastic separate at the beginning, and that way you will not have to uh, disentangle them or sort them at your MRF. Uh, you know, MRF are amazing. They uh, do an incredible job. But having people standing on ladders and picking bottles out of a moving conveyor belt does not seem like a 21st century solution to me. We need to create better ways of doing this, either by preventing the need to sort at the beginning or by creating machine-readable codes similar to the colored stripes that are human-readable. Um, Avoid toxic materials in plastics. Once a toxic chemical gets into a plastic and you recycle that plastic, you've now contaminated your entire recycling stream. I would ask that you extend uh, Act 188, the uh, Children's Safe Product Act, to packaging so that uh, children's toys that are packaged, the food we eat that is packaged, does not contain toxic materials that then either leach directly into our food or get into our recycling streams. So it's difficult to recycle those materials. So in conclusion, uh, I hope that the recommendations I've made here will help you in meeting the five objectives with which you've been charged. Uh, in summary, they are make recycling easy, make the rules uniform, uh, and keep toxics out of our recycling stream. And I would be pleased to entertain any questions. Thank you. Um, I'd like to jump in and ask, so in the, one of the challenges I alluded to before, for instance, on this uh, signal system we were talking about that hasn't yet been adopted nationally, Vermont, uh, our ambitions are sometimes thwarted by being a small player in a much bigger marketplace. So when you think of, um, I'm trying to think of how you see yourself in the marketplace as well. So are you limited by what you can go out and buy from other people or do you have to have things custom manufactured for you? 
So we, we are limited. Seventh generation of thinking about the circular economy uh, for its packaging uses the highest amount of post-consumer recycled plastic we can. Currently, across all our packaging, we're at 86 percent. Uh, our goal for 2020 was to be at 100 percent. I don't think we'll quite meet that. And to design all of our packaging so it can be recycled, so that we can have a complete loop that gets recycled and then we'll reuse it. Currently, we're at 97 percent of our packaging being recyclable. Uh, we um, have to rely on our material suppliers to get us pure enough uh, plastics to make into our bottles and minimize the discoloration that occurs when materials get mixed and recycled. Uh, and sometimes we can only get up to about 80% recycled content because uh, the recycled plastic doesn't have the same mechanical properties as a pure virgin material does. So there are issues, but they can be overcome to a very great extent. Uh, another anecdote that I think is very telling, when we were acquired by Unilever in October of 2016, so it's just about three years, uh, and I was asked what our recycling rate was, and I said, or our PCR content was, I said about 86%. Actually, at that time, I think it was about 84%. And the VP of sustainability turned to the Unilever packaging engineer and said, what is the Unilever packaging rate? And she said 1.4%. The VP of sustainability said, find out how they're doing it. And this year, just three years later, Unilever is announcing that they are at a 50% PCR content rate in North America. So the uh, Technology is transferable from small companies like Seventh Generation to behemoths like Unilever. One thing, I'm sorry, Representative. I want not to interrupt this thought, but after. Okay. My thought uh, was that I have read that if the uh, packaged good companies like Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, uh, P&G, all meet the recycling rate of 25% that they have promised by 2030, there will not be enough PCR material. Uh, I will point out that, A, we don't collect much more than 10% of the plastics that uh, are needed. And B, uh, much of the plastics that are now being collected uh, don't have a home. So if we can collect them and keep them separated, we'll be able to meet the demands for higher levels of PCR content in the future. So, so um, help me with the obvious. PCR is an acronym for post-consumer consumer recycled. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I apologize. And, and, yeah. and um, toxics in plastics. Um, how, how, I, I'm recently learning how difficult it actually is to get products, built products, such as a chair or, or pick one that doesn't have toxic chemicals in it. How um, is it is it very difficult for you to find um, plastics for your for your packaging that um, do not have toxic uh, chemicals in them or a, an ex some sort of an acceptable amount might be where you are and as you look into the circular economy having to pull those toxics out in a reimagined piece of work. So using a toxic material to make a virgin plastic is often a choice. In our current linear economy, that choice is often driven by cost mm -hmm. or convenience. Yeah. Uh, you can usually find an alternative. Some states, for example, California, now have what they uh, call alternatives assessments mandatory 
when a toxic chemical is identified in a particular product. As a company that uses very high levels of post-consumer recycled plastic, we have almost no control over toxics in the plastic. Um, we use plastics that typically have very low levels to begin with, uh, number one and number two plastics. But because of mixing in the recycle screen, we often get trace levels of phthalates from PVC that got mixed in with the number one and two screens. Um, and sometimes we get heavy metals. Sometimes we'll get DPA because of uh, polycarbonate that might have gotten into the screen. But typically, the levels are low enough that they are not of concern. So they are acceptable yeah. to us. And, and, and I guess finally for me at the moment is, um, I think one of the prizes we may have our eye on is extended um, producer responsibility. And this afternoon, you have spoken about remanufacture, remaking, recycling. Where does um, seventh generation stand on um, EPR? We are strong supporters of EPR. We think that companies that design products do not, uh, should not abdicate the responsibility for those products and packaging once it leaves their loading dock. Okay. That they should be thinking clearly about what happens to that material after it's used. Thank you. Mr. Wolf, uh, two, two good questions for you to build off of Representative McCullough's question. Uh, looking at the different schemes, we heard a lot about EPR last week or two weeks ago. Do you have a preference between Quebec and British Columbia in terms of the approach? I don't know enough about the two systems to be able to comment on that. Okay. Uh, and then you talked about design for being recyclable. It's something a lot of us have struggled with in industry to understand what is considered recyclable, right? Do you guys have an internal definition of when you're designing a package for what is really considered recyclable, is that from your perspective or in the marketplace, or do you have a benchmark for that? We, we use the Federal Trade Commission definition that a uh, package is readily recyclable if recycling facilities are available to roughly 60% of the U.S. population. Okay, good, that's all, thank you. Um, I'd like to follow up on, uh, yeah, do you know, so I was just trying to, you're putting a lot of effort into re re using post-consumer recycled materials in creating your packaging. Do you know what the fate of your packages are once they've gone off and consumers have finished using them? We do not. We have tried uh, using various techniques to ask our consumers how much they recycle, and then compare that to the conventional consumer. And virtually all consumers say they recycle at a roughly 60% rate. So we think that they're exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> well, and if, it, if it's mixing your materials with uh, different sorts of plastic, then we're back to the earlier challenge you were citing that harder to get a high quality recycled waste if it's uh, combined with other types of plastic, right? Yep. Yes, um, what percentage, well, perhaps a better way to ask it is, would you break down by percentages the types of plastics um, you use in your packaging? Uh, not chemically, but by use film plastic, for instance. Uh, Certainly. So. Most of our packaging is rigid plastic uh, containers. These are 100 ounce laundry bottles, 25 ounce uh, dish liquid bottles, and they are the bulk of our packaging by weight. Um, I don't know the exact percentage, but I can find out. Uh, we use uh, plastic film on uh, things like bath tissue, paper towels, um, uh, period care products, and such. And uh, that works for me, the bulk of, yeah, for sure. It's probably close to 80 20. I don't know precisely. So, if I'm hearing right, it seems like you're proposing that in order for you as a company that are put, impose self 
selling those percentages are new. In order for you to meet that, those percentages, you need more recycling to happen. That is correct. And even if more recycling happens in a mixed use system, you still wouldn't be able to, because of contamination, you wouldn't be able to get to your levels. That would, that would significantly limit us. You know, obviously, it depends on how much can be separated out at the MRF. Uh, but more recycling should make more material available, but certainly the purer it is, the better off we are and the better off our consumers are. Okay, and so you, as unlike other companies, you're self-imposing this percentage. What in here, what would you recommend? Because most companies don't give a benchmark like you have mm -hmm. done. Do you so, have any thoughts on that, or is that out of your? I'm not sure I understand the question. What do I think companies should use as a percentage of post-consumer no, recycling? No, meaning that a lot of what you've shared with us is huh. how to get more recycling content so that companies that are on the track you're on can have it. Yes. But another whole thing that we have looked at is how companies who don't, who haven't self-imposed benchmarks, how would they increase? How would we influence them to increase? So one thought I had on that was if um, materials are sold into the state of Vermont, there be a fee, as is done, I believe, in Ontario and British, and that fee would be reduced if there are high levels of post-consumer recycled plastic in their packaging. So that would incentivize them to use higher levels of PCR. And similarly, I would impose a fee on non-recyclable packaging. If something could not be recycled, then uh, there should be a fee paid by the company, again, to discourage the use of that material, those materials. It's another question in terms of thinking through getting more clean content back to you guys to use for inputs. Are you supporting going to a, instead of a single source or, or single one curbside bin, you want separate bins for, for everything? Uh, not necessarily for everything, but I think having some sort of consumer pre-sorting is desirable. One possible approach would be extending the bottle bill to all uh, PET and HDPE containers, not just carbonated beverages and certain alcoholic beverages so that we get uh, the pure PET from um, juice bottles and from drinking water bottles. So that, because consumers bring these back and uh, either through Tomra reverse vending machines or at a uh, uh, recycling uh, uh, location, you get a pure stream that material stays pure. And in fact, that type of stream seldom went to China because there's such demand for those materials domestically. So supporting the deposit system too on all the laundry bottles is what yes. you're suggesting? Yes. Okay. Um, have you, does seventh gen work with, seventh generation work with uh, the solid waste districts either here or elsewhere? So, hear about what happens on their end of things when they, they come into a MRF or they come into their, to their system? Yes, we do. We often go to the uh, Williston MRF and talk about what we are doing in terms of our packaging to make sure that it is recyclable at the local MRF. We often ask questions about uh, whether, uh, for example, we should advise our consumers to keep the caps on the bottle or take them off. In addition, we use a system called How to Recycle, or H2R, that is uh, maintained by the, uh, I think it's Sustainable Packaging Coalition, or SPC, and we encourage a minimum requiring packaging to have SPC directions on it, so consumers have some information about how to manage the model. Um. I had a question about um, uh, premiums. So you're, I mean, it sounds like seventh generation has made a choice to increase post-consumer recycled uh, materials in your own packaging. 
can um, is this can you say something about what the cost premium is to go to the use of this kind of material? Is it only for more expensive goods, or can you compete in the ordinary marketplace um, if you impose that kind of higher cost structure on yourself? So. You correctly uh, point out that using PCR costs more in the packaging. The premium is in the order of a few percent uh, per package. Packaging is typically a third or less the cost of a product. So you're talking about a one or two percent increment. And it's uh, that increment can be made up in other places, in the product design, distribution, marketing. And companies have more than one lever to pull when they put a product on the shelf. Did you say Unilever? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> the peanut gallery in here, pardon me. <laughs> no, no, in, in fact, uh, I, I like to make uh, the joke. I don't know if you know the uh, Greek philosopher scientist, uh, oh my goodness, his name just escaped me. Uh, in any event, he just he said that give me a lever large enough and I can move the world. And I like to say now I have a large human lever. <laughs> um, and so if if you're uh, looking out like three five years, what's on the horizon for you in terms of packaging, waste management? Where, where are areas that you're currently working? And then I'd say secondarily, are there things that at the state level that we could be doing that would support that work? So, so uh, first, we believe there's a hierarchy in uh, packaging and single-use uh, products. And that is, uh, it is best to reduce the amount you're using. Uh, second would be to reuse the material. Third would be to recycle it. Fourth would be to um, use it in something like uh, composting, if it's a bio-based material. Then we would look at waste to energy, because in type pyrolysis or uh, chemical recycling, as it's now being called. And finally, landfilling. Uh, well, actually, and after that, incineration without energy recovery. So that, that's our hierarchy. So first, we're looking at how we can reduce our use of packaging and make what we're calling naked products, things in which uh, the, the, the product is sold without a package. Second, we're looking at reducing specifically our use of plastic packaging, seeing if we can use uh, box board or other materials. Uh, so that if they do get into the environment, um, they will biodegrade rather than act as contaminants in waterways and in the oceans. And so I'd say those are two big initiatives right now. How the state can help us? Uh, as I said, improve the purity of the recycling stream, avoid mixing plastics, get toxic uh, chemicals out of the plastics. Uh, we're all familiar with PFAS. Uh, we don't want it in our packaging. Uh, we don't want it in our food. We don't want it in our groundwater. And we don't want it uh, contaminating our recycle. Uh, and uh, increase the amount of recycling. Make it easier for consumers to recycle make it consistent across as many jurisdictions as possible so it's easier for businesses and win as many uh, uh, fellow states over to engage in these systems to increase the supply and keep things out of the environment. Um, are there any other questions for Mr. Wolf? So thank you very much. Thank you for coming in and helping us. Look back at what we've covered so far and um, reflect upon, if I'm already, so this is meeting three, six, 
and I'm already thinking a little bit ahead to uh, beginning to outline our report and what areas we've already taken sufficient testimony to feel as though we can begin drafting the report, and uh, which we'll do with the help of the Legislative Council, um, and areas in which you feel like um, we're not ready yet, and we, uh, we want to make sure that we do some additional work, um, that we target our time well, in the, so that by roughly, I think, before the fifth meeting, we will have some version of a draft to start circulating so that we'll have some editing time together as a committee, even while we continue to take some testimony and tune the report. But we're really only about a month away from a, a first draft or so. So it uh, happens fast, but that's, that's our schedule for the fall with six meetings. So, um, so let me just pause to give people a chance to look back at your notes, and uh, <coughs> and then we have, we, we have an agenda for today and things for next week. But I wanted to make sure that we don't overlook something that you feel like, yeah, if, I, I know that I need to hear more. And we're going to get some helpful. The, the powers and duties of the working group, but uh, you'll see in the subsequent subsection that the report is supposed to address all of these and provide the recommendations of the working group for each of these categories under the powers and duties. Um, so the, the first one is evaluate the success of existing state and municipal requirements for the management of unwanted single-use products. Uh, to an extent, what Kathy and the agency brought forward um, was intended, I believe, from the agency's perspective, to address that and the testimony they provided. Similarly, in Subdivision 2, estimate the effects on landfill capacity of single-use products that can be recycled but are currently being disposed. I believe the agency intended their report to address that as well. Likewise, summarize the effects on the environment and natural resources of failure to manage single-use products appropriately, including propensity to create litter and the effects on human health. Uh, I think the agency's um, submitted materials would address that as well. So as for purposes of the report, um, either boiling down the agency's report and or referencing them, would likely suffice for the first three subdivisions. And we're going to have some more testimony on health impacts today as well. Okay. So then you come to the fourth to recommend methods or mechanisms to address the effects on landfill capacity of single use products that can be recycled but are currently being disposed in order to improve the management of single use products in the state including whether the state should establish extended producer responsibility or similar requirements for manufacturers, distributors, or brand owners of single-use products. So I have heard several different proposals uh, or methods or mechanisms. One would be the EPR programs, either the Quebec or the British Columbia model, uh, or the traditional models that are being used in Vermont. The others are things like what Scott Cassell referenced last week, the, the echo-modulated fees being used in Italy and some of the other European countries. Uh, then similarly, the, what, I, what I think is more of a tax uh, in the Netherlands, you have a lower fee imposed on you if you have a certain type of product or container as opposed to um, a less recyclable type of container, then there's a higher fee slash tax. Um, you just heard a proposal from, from Mr. Wolf, uh, which has, has several components, um, either mandates for content or incentives for content of the material, mandates for labeling or incentives for labeling of the material, um, take back program fees, uh, so that's a kind of a combination. Um, it uses those echo modulated fees, but also potentially has some 
labeling and or content requirements, potentially some separation requirements. Um, so, so those are about three or four different mechanisms that you've heard, the methods that you've heard. I couldn't say I've heard a uniform voice from the committee on any of those. Michael, we've, we've also gotten a, um, a handout from, from Beeberg and um, that actually that, that, that speaks of, of an EPR and a combined with, with a um, deposit um, for returnable uh, returnables as well and a pretty extensive uh, and out on, I don't know, I'll need a nod from, from in back, but I think it's Ontario, uh, yes, uh, where they successfully commingled, if you will, um, these two concepts. Um, so I, I, I think the group needs to, and I think we, we will we'll, we'll need your advice also if, if bringing that deposit concept into our management of single-use plastic products is within our within our um, project description here. Well, um, I think that raises a couple of different questions. First, uh, you're supposed to recommend the products that you want the methods or mechanisms to apply to. Um, and so I think if you wanted to apply to some products but not others, then you could differentiate and say a program or method or mechanism isn't going to apply to those current beverage containers that are being collected under the, the beverage redemption system. I think you have opportunity to change the definition of what a beverage container is. I think Mr. Hackman referenced the wine bottles earlier. Uh, <laughs> uh, that there's opportunity for other types of containers to come in. You've seen multiple bills on that over the years. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, you know, frankly, the, the bottle bill is itself something of an extended producer responsibility program. Uh, it just requires the consumer to put um, a deposit down. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are programs like that for other types of products around the world. Um, so, and Scott Cassell actually referenced it in his materials about how you can come up with hybrids of the existing programs, uh, including bringing in EPR and bottle bill together. Uh, so I, I think that's within the committee's jurisdiction or authority if they want to recommend that, and they have options. Good, thank you. Okay. Anything else you want to add to the materials list? Again, not just bottles, <laughs> wine bottles, not a client, not an issue. Um, <laughs> I believe there's, there was in the late 90s a program, and I can uh, done some research on it relative to Florida, and uh, it was a one cent, two cent fee on all packages, and I think there was something in Delaware called the Penny Plan. So if we're looking at financing mechanisms, Sounds similar to deposit, except for the fact the consumer doesn't get the deposit back, it funds recycling. So, in terms of looking at other benchmarks, I know we're going to talk about Maine later, um, that's a benchmark that I'd like at least considered in the report to do that. So but it, it's basically what Delaware did when Delaware did with away with its, its beverage container fee and moved yeah. to a time limited. It was, they called it a fee, but it was still a tax. And it, it didn't go back to the consumer. Went into a fund to capitalize the fund that was then used to to provide um, recycling services throughout the state. Warren. 
Um, another set of policies we've touched on but haven't um, dug into it all are um, looking at possible bans of some material like black plastics that are a challenge to the recycling system, toxic, and meet some of the other criteria. So I think that's an area as we're looking at the suite of policies as well. Um, and the other thing that we had talked about a little last time and maybe we'll talk about, but I think kind of to Andy's point of what's the scope of what we're talking about and can we, do we have a shared goal or understanding of where we're trying to get or what we're trying to focus on as a group to help us look at the, um, which policies best get us there? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, and just, you know, one of the things I'll turn to Kathy on this, um, energy work, we're often targeting um, a particular date in the future to achieve some sort of milestone as in um, percentage of renewable energy in the grid or reduction of greenhouse gases. So when you think about solid waste and single-use products in that stream, do you, um, I know we have, a way, we have a timeline for organics in 138, but is there a timeline or a series of milestones and R has in mind as you contemplate uh, where Ron's going? Um, so two things in response to that. So generally, with our statewide plan, we call it the materials management plan, it used to be the solid waste plan. Uh, we have a statewide goal that we would um, reach 50% diversion. And originally, this came out, oh gosh, 15 years ago. Uh, and we have not yet achieved that, unfortunately. So if you look at all the materials that we generate um, and you know what, what materials we dispose, what we recycle, we're at about 36% diversion. So we haven't achieved that goal yet. Um, so, so that's kind of like the big goal. Um, with respect to the narrow, and, and that's all materials, if we look at just single-use products, which is a subset of all of that materials, we could define a specific goal for those materials. If you want to look at the work that's being proposed right now in Washington State or in California, that's exactly what they're doing. California's saying 75% 70, reduction, you know, by what, 2030? Yeah, so they, they, they get a mark out there, okay? Figure out how you're gonna do this, but this is the goal you have to meet. Um, some states are looking at um, um, all the material that you generate. It has to have a certain percent uh, recycled content or compostability by a certain date. That's another goal out there. So there's another way of looking at that goal. Um, we've been thinking internally, like, what approach should we be taking with this group of materials? And um, one of the concerns is when the materials are likely to get out into the environment, because they're more likely to end up as litter, we might want to treat those materials differently than the things that are likely to get either recycled or disposed. So the example Jen Holiday gave last time was the coffee container for that pound of coffee. You know, whether it's in a steel can or a rigid plastic can, or, or, or a, a flexible packaging material, all of those materials are likely to either end up in your trash or recycling bin. So why not use the one that causes the least environmental um, impact, which might actually be the non-recyclable material because it creates less greenhouse gas emissions. So how do you deal with that is you could deal with that if we were to have an EPR program is to incentivize based on the environmental impact for those materials that are likely to either get disposed or recycled. For single-use products that are more associated with probably convenience of food and beverages, we might want to keep them separate and have a mandate. You either ban it or make it out of a material that can naturally decompose under natural conditions. Not composting, that's high temperature. You don't get that in nature. But because we're getting all these microplastics, you can't continue to have disposable items, or even call them recyclable items, if they're likely to get out in the environment, because that impact will still be there. So I think we need to have a two-pronged approach. Well, actually three, and mandate recycled content. <laughs> so can you go through those three again, please? So one would be have a program, 
such as EPR, that encompasses all printed materials, paper, and packaging. Because those are the items that are likely not to hopefully get littered, um, whether they're recyclable or not right now. And they're part of the EPR system, and the fees would be based on their environmental impacts. How do you determine what that is? It's, it, you know, I think that's complicated. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's going to take some time to sort out, but in the end, it would be well worth the time. Agreed. I'm just wondering if you'd be able to wait to do that. You know, I think, you know, Washington and Oregon are leaders in that area right now, and I, I wouldn't do it alone. I would collaborate with the, the other yeah. states that are leaders in this. Yeah. And you said paper and packaging, so. It's not just plastics, right? So it's your Correct. Story. Correct. So. If you look at this chart that we shared at the beginning um, of what gets thrown away currently, you know, organics is the biggest part. That's why we have Act 148. And then we have paper and plastic. So those are our big components of the waste stream. If we really want to pull stuff out of disposal, we have to target those materials. So that's the first part step. Right. The second step with single-use plastics that aren't part of the PPP um, would either have to be banned or be required to be made from materials that naturally decompose under natural conditions. So if you want to keep three, hmm? cut the plastic cutlery. Cut three. So rather than trying to ban each and every one of these, which you know that's like whack-a-mole, we'll never catch up, right? Yeah. Just you know have a have a more uh, umbrella type program that phases it in, you know, just like universal recycling. We, we had time to implement these things. It's not going to go overnight with a light switch. That would just be chaos. But that would be the goal. And then the third goal would be... Can I ask a quick question? So sure. our, you know, the impression I have of a lot of cutlery, for instance, is regardless, even if it has corn starch in it or something like that, that there are other stabilizers in there to make it into a better implement that make it so long live that when you open up a landfill, it's sitting in there intact years and years later. Is that a, is that a representative anecdote? Or I mean, I don't know the data on that. Yeah, I think my concern is not so much what happens to it in the landfill, is what happens when it's out in the environment. Because the landfill actually is a, a in my opinion, it's kind of a safer place because then it's not causing the microplastics and the nanoplastics that get back to us or back to um, other wildlife or organisms. Um, it's when it's um, inappropriately discarded in litter that then it's causing, it's contributing to the, the microplastic problems that we have throughout the globe. But the, the, the following on um, Senator Gray's thought, maybe a little deeper, and something you said, either ban it or it is compostable, I think was the word, in a natural environment. Right. I, so I then use the it, word compostable because compost usually means high. Okay. So what was your, what, okay, so what was your biodegradable. biodegradable in a natural environment? And that would preclude then the the cutlery that had some percentage of of uh, plastics in there. Correct. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So biodegradable without any plastic component. Correct. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then you had a third category. Third would be um, requiring materials to have a post-consumer recycled content, like Mr. Wolf was referring to before, where seventh generation is certainly a leader in that. But um, to help with the market of these materials and to encourage the use of recycled materials, I think we have to have that closed loop. And um, as you think about that, is that for goods manufactured in Vermont, all goods sold in Vermont? How would most of our, our laws are? activities in Vermont, right, Michael? So. Yeah, but it's, it's the whole gamut, manufactured, distributed, sold, offered for sale. Okay. Kathy, 
is that similar to the modulating fee that you were talking about when you gave your presentation a few weeks ago, this last one? Um, recycled uh, content, I think, is not necessarily a base requirement. It's just like in order, you know, eventually, just like, you know, California and Washington are proposing that to sell single-use products or, or, or packaging, it has to have a, if it has recycled material in there, you have to be using a certain percentage of recycled content in there. So the plastic container for your laundry shouldn't just come from virgin plastic. Right. It should have a certain percentage of recycled content. Is there a specific program in California referencing because the legislation hasn't passed yet, right? No, I, and I didn't mean to imply that it had passed, but these are what other states are looking to do to make a change. Do you have a sense of, in California, the state of that discussion? I mean, obviously, if we were piggybacking on California, that's a, a big ride to get. So I think they actually passed the recycled content for their beverage, the plastic beverage containers in their bed, um, bottle mill, correct? Yeah, bottle mill with recycled content. So, so that first part passed. Mm -hmm. They will continue the discussion, and I can't remember the number of the bill. I had it one. Central 54, Senate so Bill 1080. Right. There's, a, there's another bill that's looking at a certain percent of recycled content by 2030. Right. Can you say those numbers again, please? Senate Bill 54, Senate Bill 1080. Senator Allen and Senator Miller Gonzalez. Thank you. Okay. Not that you've been following. Would expanding the bottle bill be under your number one? Kind of as it is now. So I think, first of all, when we look at um, different um, EPR programs, and you'll see in Canada, they kept their bottle bill, I think, as is, that's parallel with their EPR program. And we might want to consider doing that in Vermont as well. Um, um, if we are to move materials into the bottle bill, um, we could look at that as what, what is the benefit from doing that and what materials would gain the most by doing that. And eventually what would be great is if we had a system that was more, you know, this is really pie in the sky, but instead of what kind of beverage it was, it's more like what kind of container it is. I think that you know, take a lot of the confusion out of it. Um, and when you're talking about bottle bill, um, are you thinking of new products or expansion of, in, to your last point, really, for instance, yeah. um, Wine bottles, you know. The, one of the most common questions I get is why why would we have beer bottles included and wine bottles not that kind of thing. That that's an excellent question. That's where and this is this is a broader discussion. I'm yes. not saying this is yep. A and R's position, but you might want to consider, you know, how you deal with glass, for instance, you know, as a container and which system is, is it better to be in. Um, to build on the conversation of expanding the bottle bill, um, I would I question the capacity of the system. Uh, so I would like to have an explanation of what it will look like and how it will be handled. Um, who can manage that? Um, and we certainly would need to hear from those businesses and organizations impacted by that expansion. And thank you for bringing that up. And just full disclosure, we're having parallel discussions with um, the bottle bill stakeholders right now because the number of sorts that redemption centers currently have to do is getting to be quite high and um, quite challenging for them to perform. So we're looking for efficiencies. And in, and in that discussion, we're just, we have to make some assumptions. So we're assuming the bottle bill stays as if it is, but how can we make that a more efficient system? So that's just kind of on a parallel track right now. So you want the expansion of the bottle bill to be known as Aaron's bill? No. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's no. Right. So, you know, to, to, to uh, comment on, on, on 
Aaron's, Aaron's thoughts. The, the um, presentation that we got just as a, an enclosure from Beeperg and the Ontario system, which actually marries an expansion of container deposits with EPR, um, and also speaks about the management concerns about, I mean, like right now, our, our returnables are handled by, by Baker and Farrell, and uh, to use the, the, the uh, distributor's names, excuse me, but, but um, this Ontario system has it imagined differently, much more like our thermostats are, for instance. And, and I think if we had a presentation from Beeper on that, that combination, um, it would be very useful for us. And can you, when you said compared to uh, thermostats, so how would you compare, how, do we, how are we doing thermostats now? Well, thermostats aren't, aren't being um, uh, taken back as an EPR, are being taken back as an EPR. Um, that's roughly accurate, I think you could say. And, 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 but they're being, they're being collected not by, not by, um, they're being collected by a consortium that, that manages that collection. Same with um, mercury containing light bulbs. Um, not, um, not a distributor that trucks them around the state and then has to get them come and pick them up and then bring them back to their site. It's a, it's a more global look at, at the collection. Thank you. Um, okay. If I could just think of what yes. a comment kind of building on the capacity issue um, for the uh, redemption centers, the MERP system does have capacity to handle many more containers. Our challenge is a lack of technology in both of the facilities. So with an investment in the technology and the sorting, we can absolutely handle a significant number of additional containers in that system. And then that does kind of call into question the need for those parallel systems of both a container redemption system and a blue, essentially a blue bin system. Um, and we've been looking at uh, different technologies and, and building a new materials required facility at CSWD we've been looking at for the past 18 months um, and hopefully will be underway in the next couple of years. And that would get um, the sorting out of literally out of people's hands and be done by technology. So people would be more quality control versus the actual sorting. So when you say uh, sorting containers, what kind of containers? Everything? Bottles, jugs, everything that um, you know, Mr. Wolf was talking about, so anything that's PET, anything that's HDP, um, as far as um, we're looking at film, like can we take film through the blue bin? You know, what are some of the possibilities that the newer technology affords us that we just don't have in Vermont right now? So and we've gone across the, the country into Canada looking at what other people are doing and what would make the most sense. So knowing that um, there are a lot of containers that are making their way into the disposal system, what are some of those barriers and how can we pull them out and make that clean stream? So what Mr. Wolf was talking about, um, we don't have a lot of contamination coming in the door at our mark, but when the way it sorts, we do see some, some leakage of some PPT in the HDPE stream and some HDPE in the PPT. Technology, uh, optical sorting, remove that. So that's what we're talking about. So bottles, jugs, all of that. So I didn't quite follow. So um, you were saying you didn't have a lot of contamination coming through the door. Mm -hmm. I think a blue bin stuff, though, is mm -hmm. that's all the plastics all together. Yeah. So uh, what's, can you explain that? That seems mixed to me. Sure, mixed, yeah, it is. It is Mixed in contamination, I guess, are not the same. It is, it is counter, that's right. So when we're actually very fortunate in Vermont to have a very educated recycling population. Uh, we do not see a lot of contamination at the generators, so by people in businesses. Um, and most single stream or combined MRF systems coming in the door, they'll see anywhere between 20 and 25% contamination, things that just shouldn't be in that bin. And then they can 
sort that out through their technological um, devices within their facilities. We both have just people, by and large, sorting. So because we have good uh, um, compliance with the materials by people, you know, I'm generating, I'm putting the, by and large, the right stuff into my bin, that's not the problem for us, for the material coming out. It's when it gets to the, the lack of technology in the sorting system. Um, in our work, in, in Williston, we have to send materials through twice because we have to keep the belts running slow enough for people to pick out the material. Um, and it's a hard job. It is a very hard job. So by adding technology, adding sortation technology, we can get that, that end result that's getting shipped to market to be even cleaner and make it even more competitive. Because being in a small market, we have to be as competitive as possible um, in order to bring value to that material. And by adding technology, which is what we're looking at doing, and I know that Casella's got some great works uh, throughout their system, really high-tech stuff, um, doing the same thing, that will improve our competitiveness and improve the quality of material coming out of the system. And therefore, also allow us to handle many more containers in that system than we can now by just having people sort it. Um, and just a quick question on glass, which seems to be particularly challenging, it's like its own story, right? Right. If there were more, um, this question, I don't want to make people worry, but if there were more types of glass bottles that had that nickel deposit on it, um, would that be helpful to the system? I would say by and large, yes. Uh, and keeping in mind, too, that that glass that goes through the container deposit system, the bottle bill system, has the best chance of being made into a new glass bottle. By and large, uh, that material can either be made into a bottle or into fiberglass. It has the highest potential for being um, actually recycled. And glass that goes through a merc system, traditionally, historically, has not had that highest use. It's used for other things, um, but not bottle to bottle. So if part of the um, the thrust is to get more glass into a higher and better use, then yes, directing it into a container deposit or a bottle of the system would at least give it that potential. Okay. So we had some testimony in committee last year where there were some facilities or halls actually that were taking sorted clean glass and they there was a market that would pay them for the materials as opposed to having it be a cost center to dispose of it. Is that your impression for your facility as well? We, I don't know that we would be able to get paid. We can't get paid for our glass right. coming out of the mark right. for a container deposit system. Right. If there were more of the desirable glass, which the highest most desired glass is the clear, because you can make it any color that you mm -hmm. want. Um, if you can get good, clear, clean glass into that deposit system, it has a chance for marketability. And that clear glass kind of carries mm -hmm. the colorful glass along with it, um, but some of that colored glass does have some applicability as well. The brown can be made back into beer bottles very easily, then, but it's that clear glass that has potential. Can I just add a little to that? I think he's, I think you're referring to the Northeast Kingdom Solid Waste Management District who was right. separating their glass through a dual stream system. Right. And I believe their glass is going to 2M, which is the same place our glass from the Rutland Mark is going and made into a fiberglass product. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Is that to Quebec? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, well, that's uh, we're, thank you very much. Anything, anything else people want to put on the table? A helpful conversation to sort through what what we heard so far. Yeah. Just one further final request. Um, uh, Mr. Wolf was talking about your recyclability. Is it eighty six percent? Is that what? Our recyclable rate is 97 97 And then is that um, Unilever is going to announce 50% this 50 year? 50% is PCR input. PCR input. And we're at 86% PCR input. Okay, PCR input. So I, that was commendable and very impactful for me to hear. I think that it would be um, helpful for the committee to understand what manufacturers are doing now, because uh, 10 years ago it was 1%, um, and we've seen a 49% increase in Unilever. I think that's huge. 
Um, so I think it would be beneficial for um, additional manufacturers to come in and explain what it is they're doing. Um, as we all know, manufacturers are in the business of making money, so they want to listen to their consumers, and consumers say we want more recyclable products. So I'm sure they're doing it. We just maybe haven't heard about it. So it would be helpful to hear that. Okay. Um, maybe through your... Um, Associations, you can help us find some people to hear from. I mean, great. All right, so we are right up on schedule to call the uh, state of Maine. Hello, Elena and Laura. Elena and Paula. Oh, Elena and Paula, I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, State Senator Chris Bray uh, speaking. Um, you're on speakerphone in room 10 in the Vermont State House, and uh, we have a single-use products working group, uh, and we've been following what you all have been up to a little bit, and we'd love to learn more because, not surprisingly, Vermont's facing a similar challenge, and we're looking at um, what you're looking at in order to plot a course for ourselves here. So could you tell us about the, the work you all have been doing, please? Okay. Well, um, we, um, you know, we found out about your meeting not um, only a matter of days ago, so we don't really have a formal presentation for you, but we're happy to generally share some information about what we've done and what we're doing. Great. And if you have questions, we can certainly attempt to answer those as well. Uh, my name is Paula Clark. I'm the director of the Division of Materials Management. And um, we are uh, in Maine. Uh, we have a number of EPR programs that have been in place for quite some time. Uh, and we also have a product stewardship framework law. Um, that framework law sets up the, uh, some of the criteria for selection of certain products um, for uh, treatment under some EPR program. And um, annually, the department provides to the Maine legislature a product stewardship report. That report is an opportunity for us to uh, report back on programs that are in place, uh, the progress, any issues. Uh, we have the opportunity um, to recommend legislation if improvements are necessary. Uh, we actually took advantage of that this past session and made some program improvements that uh, were long overdue. And the other thing that that report allows us to do is to recommend specific products um, for, for new programs. This year, um, there were uh, four um, things in particular that were put forward as good candidates uh, for EPR programs. Um, and two of those, uh, we are in the process of developing further to present uh, reports and recommendations to the legislature on in January. So the four items um, were pharmaceuticals, solar panels, packaging, and mattresses. And we are currently in the process of uh, refining um, a packaging proposal and uh, completing a report on the management of, of mattresses, uh, possibly with an EPR component attached to it. Um, the packaging piece um, is um, um, extremely interesting. Um, it's, it's quite complex. And um, Elena uh, Bertacci um, has been leading that effort to put together the conceptual model. Um, there is a process in place for gathering information, and um, she has done a great deal of work on that. So I thought I could turn that over to her, and she can give you an outline of the approach that we're talking about and uh, some of the, the particulars um, of, that, um, of that proposal. Okay, hi. Um, what we're doing is we're responding to this um, LD1431, Resolve to Support Municipal Recycling Program, uh, which basically directs DEP to develop legislation uh, creating a packaging product stewardship program that the legislature will consider next session. And it sets out um, a few requirements. Um, I'm going to get to the, the structure of, of such a program. They want um, 
this program to cover at least 80 percent of municipal costs of recycling. They want it to also provide per capita payment to municipalities to help cover the cost of, of non-recyclable packaging. Um, they want differential costs so that you incentivize recyclability, lower toxicity, and use of recycled content. And then they also want um, money for investment in education and infrastructure. Um, and you know, they also said a few more things. Uh, we're not dealing with bottle bill material. They want to exempt bottle bill material and, and bottle bill as is. They want to exempt small producers, which we haven't defined, but uh, we need to. And um, packaging is defined rather broadly. Um, at says, at a minimum, materials used to wrap or protect consumer goods and containers and packaging used in the shipping, storage, protection, and marketing of consumer products. Um, so they set out that outline, um, and then we've since uh, gone through a process to try to um, collect as much information from interested parties and stakeholders um, to help inform our, our writing of this legislation. Um, we created a list of interested parties um, based on, you know, starting with the entities that had originally commented on this first bill and then adding additional entities we knew were working on packaging and that we knew uh, we were hoping would show an interest in, and contribute uh, with some information. And then we sent them all an initial request for ideas uh, for a program that would be in line with the LD and, and what's required by the LD. Um, and we didn't receive too much back there. We didn't expect to. That was sort of just, you know, for entities that may have already done a lot of work on this. Um, and then we sent out a conceptual model, um, which uh, is also outlined in the, um, the PowerPoint that I believe um, you have there in front of you. Um, and, and asked for comments on that conceptual model and then also held um, four open meetings um, throughout the state at our different regional offices where we collected um, comments and answered questions about that. And then we've had a number of smaller meetings um, with specific stakeholders and stakeholder groups to try to look more carefully at certain issues that um, we have outstanding. Um, and then, you know, we're at the point now where we're still having some of these small meetings, um, still collecting, you know, comments that come in and looking um, to try to finalize our language internally. And then by December 16th, we'll need to submit something to the legislature. And what's your work product? A report or draft legislation or? Um, they asked for draft legislation. Oh. Yeah, we'll, we'll have that accompanied by some additional information. Do you have a couple of schematics there that outline generally the approach um, that the concept has, has taken? It might be helpful if Elena runs through those. Okay, so so if you see, I mean, there's only one page that has pictures on it, or maybe there are two. So there's one that's for readily, readily recyclable materials. We've broken this out into readily recyclable and not readily recyclable um, because the LD uh, is wanting to make sure that um, we aren't just dealing with the recyclable packaging and um, having those entities that put their that package their materials in in stuff that's really just trash exempt from the law. That would not be um, a good incentive. And so, um, Can I ask a quick question. So, what what makes a uh, product readily recyclable versus not readily recyclable? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, that's been one of the harder questions we're grappling with. Um, and I think the approach we're going to take is in the um, statute to sort of define it um, according to some characteristics. The characteristics that we are sort of settling on at the moment are um, accessibility, sortability, and um, existence of a market. So, and, and by existence of a market, it doesn't mean that, you know, in all places in Maine, it has to be um, financially viable to send this material out and you make money at the other end. But, you know, if you were to bring sorted material to the door of a factory, there's someone who's willing to pay for it. Um, so I think those are the criteria that we are um, 
specific materials are going to classify that year as readily recyclable and which aren't. Okay. Because we imagine that will change. We hope that it, that list will increase, you know, will get longer. Is the, what's, can you say a little more about the, the how readily depends on, is it the degree to which it's easy to get that material recycled or that there's a market for material that's been collected and that someone's trying to recycle into the marketplace? I'm trying to figure out which step is the test um, of its, whether or not it's readily recyclable. Um, I think I think a couple of those steps. I think that everyone has seen to think that the most important is that there's the demand, the 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 market exists. Um, but at the same time, if you've got a um, tiny little, you know, like a beer cap, it's made of metal, right? Um, but it's not readily recyclable because you're never going to be able to sort that out in a MRF and um, and recycle it. You're never going to be able to. You know, I mean, maybe you can at some point in time, but currently you can't. Um, so, so that's where the sortability factor comes in, and that's a little complicated because we also have entities that do uh, source separation in Maine, and so they have slightly different requirements. But we have a meeting actually coming up next week with um, all of our. We're sort of taking a play, a step out of Massachusetts playbook. They um, had a big meeting with all of their um, entities that do recycling in the state, or I guess process recycling in the state um, and and sort of talked about all those issues and, and came to an agreement on what what they would consider to be recyclable okay. and so we're going to talk to them a little bit about you know what um, the sortability criteria would be and, and how they apply also to the people who are doing source separated could or don't or, or you know how we could how we could make that work um, and then access is a little bit difficult because we're not sure um, whether we want to be um, saying that that you know if this municipality decides not to collect it, you know if these municipalities over here decide not to collect this thing, all of a sudden it's not recyclable. That doesn't really make sense. Um, so access may actually not be a, a characteristic we focus on. We may just focus on the sortability and the, and the market. And when you talk about the market, are you helping drive the market with a PCR requirement, for instance? Not a requirement, um, because, well, I guess um, someone who has more knowledge on recycling markets could, could address this better. But you know, my understanding is that there are some um, types of plastics, for instance, where um, there is an enormous amount of material and nobody wants it. And then there are others, um, like I think LDPE fits in that category. There's an enormous amount of recycled content available and nobody wants it, to use it. And there maybe you need a recycled content or maybe it makes sense to have a recycled content requirement. But in things like PET, for instance, there's not, my understanding is that um, the market for that recycled content is actually very tight and it can be hard to actually physically obtain all the recycled content that you would need for, say, a, uh, um, a PCR requirement, unless you know you stick it out a long a number of years and then you're sort of guessing, I guess, um, whether you're going to have that content or not. So what we're going to do instead, um, the LD does want us to have differential costs incentivizing the use of recycled content. So um, most, um, I don't know how, how familiar everyone is with product stewardship, but most product stewardship um, programs work based on market share. You know, responsibility of manufacturer or producer's responsibility is, is um, comes up, is, is a result of it, is related to its share of the market that it has. How much material is it putting out there? And so we're going to adjust. So when you have that market share, it can be easy to adjust by either putting on penalties or um, uh, getting bonuses, so, so sort of adjusting that market share, um, either up or down, to include, you know, so if you use recycled content, you know, if your recycled content is, you know, 30%, your market share is going to bump down a certain amount. Um, and so 
you'll pay less. Or if you don't have any recycled content, then um, you don't get that benefit. Or if you have toxic pro products, or maybe maybe your market share even goes up. You know, it, it would go up as, as other people go down here, so goes up. Um, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. And we have another question here at the table. Hi, this is uh, Lauren Hurl. Thanks for the presentation. Really interesting to hear um, what you all are working on. One question I had was, um, so looking at a fee-based model like this, are you looking at, um, are you setting the fees in a, at like a level that would actually, is there, that there's evidence of incentivizing behavior, or is this really looking at trying to just make sure that you're covering the costs for the, running the program? Um, so that's, that's a very interesting point. Um, so that's one of the big, um, I guess, criticisms of, of a lot of EPR programs in the U.S. is we haven't done a very good job of incentivizing behavior. Um, Maine and Vermont also likely, uh, you know, whatever we charge for packaging is not going to mean much to a Unilever, right, or to, you know, these big companies. Um, so. Uh, the extent to which, you know, the way we look at this is we're sort of like another drop in the bucket. So we tr we're going to try to um, have our incentives sort of align with other entities' incentives. Because you do see, like, I think France is a good example. Um, they have a packaging EPR program. They have these modulated fees that, you know, they give bonus for recycled content. They charge extra if your material is considered a um, disruptor, you know, doesn't sort well in the, in the merc, something like that. And they've actually seen, um, they have data that shows uh, improvements to packaging. So um, it can work, but I think that a market the size of Maine or Vermont, I would assume, um, what you're really doing, you really need to, to make your incentives be in line with other incentives um, that other entities have so that, um, because is someone going to do something because Maine said that they're going to get a little extra credit on their EPR? You know, no, that's, you know, that's just an additional factor that might be considered. It's not going to be a real game changer. Great, thank you. Um, I have one uh, last question, that is, um, as you've been doing this work, I mean, I know that your early days on some pieces of this, but do you have any uh, aha moments that you would want this group here working on it to have in mind? Like, what's one of the more important realizations you've had as you've been digging into this? Um, I guess it's been, it was nice to have um, sort of the, the partial structure set out that the resolve sets out so that we had a, a starting point and that we weren't arguing about um, some of the more uh, basic structural components of this. Um, that was very helpful. It you know, sort of allowed us to immediately jump more into the details. And, and, and not be, you know, just saying, you know, and not be having a discussion of should we even be doing this. Uh, that was very helpful and I think important. Um, another thing, I, I'll say one of the biggest issues we're struggling with currently is the definition of packaging. Um, this idea of including packaging that um, used in the shipping storage and sh shipping and storage of because, um, you know, all that packaging changes a number of times when it goes from the person who's manufacturing an item to the person who buys it wholesale to the person who distributes it to then it gets to the store. And, and, and um, who's going to be responsible for each of those pieces of packaging, how you keep track of it um, is uh, not obvious to us yet. So that's a big um, outstanding issue. Um, I like that term, not obvious yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, uh, yeah, Kathy. Um, I'd like you to explain a little bit of the role of the municipality 
in Maine for managing um, MSW and recycling? Because I think it's a bit different in Vermont, and I think that would help un us understand why um, Maine is focused on the municipal reimbursement. Um, yeah, so Maine, um, I've talked to uh, Josh, a fair, Josh Kelly a fair amount about this. Um, Maine has uh, a requirement that municipalities be, you know, provide for um, municipal solid waste collection. Um, we do have some situations, like in Vermont, where the municipality does that by basically saying, contract individually with this entity over here. Um, and, and doesn't really have any direct role. But um, we in Maine do have municipalities that have um, often have a direct role. They run transfer stations um, and uh, sometimes run curbside collection programs um, or sometimes contract with someone who's going to do that. Um, and, and so um, we wanted to keep there's one of the one of the big issues with packaging EPR as opposed to a different kind of EPR. Much EPR sort of dealing with a product that's not currently managed in, in any way um, versus packaging is is really the you know the meat of the recycling industry in many respects. Um, and so if you pull all that material out of the current system and put it into a different system, you're dealing with you know, stranding a lot of investments, um, and also we were concerned potentially, you know, crippling the industry that's left. It, you know, if, if they're not able to have access to any of that material, so by by having the municipalities continue in their role, and in some cases we're hoping that they will, you know, in, in the cases where they're more like a Vermont and, and don't have a direct role, um, step up and take that role and say, okay. You know, now that we're getting reimbursed, we're going to take that on and we're going to, you know, contract with this entity to go and do the pickup. Um, you're maintaining a more, a more, um, more smaller players as opposed to uh, creating a situation where one entity that um, is the product stewardship. Uh, this is part of stewardship organization has control over all of this material that makes up, you know, much of your recycling stream. McCullough. Yes, I, um, Jim McCullough here. I'm looking at the general schematic readily recyclable page, and we're okay. just talking a lot about municipalities. And um, and yes, because as you have noted, main municipalities um, different responsibility largely than Vermont's. But thinking of municipalities in that way, we're we likely are thinking cities and towns. Um, and I immediately jump to municipalities as being um, solid waste districts. And so then, um, given that thought, because we, uh, you likely are familiar with our solid waste districts, you uh, talked a bit about Vermont system. Uh, does that make sense for us in, 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 your, in your modeling um, to, to uh, substitute that thought of our solid waste districts, if not substitute, um, include, would be a better word, uh, for reimbursement through the system, um, which uh, actually uh, comes through the, the uh, product, the producer stewardship organization. Um, I am somewhat familiar with the solid waste district, but I don't think I'm sufficiently familiar to, to be the best person to answer that question. I think it's probably Kathy or, or someone else um, who's more, more familiar with Vermont system can probably answer that better than I can. Thank you. That works for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, we have to uh, say thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much for um, participating today. Of course. Well, good luck. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So, committee, we have a call we need to make promptly at uh, 2.20. Yeah, I did and let him know we're about seven minutes behind okay. schedule. So. Thank you very much. All right, so, but if you um, take um, a type of break. All right, so we are all, we are all back and ready to go. Uh, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Great, well, thank you very much for inviting me to present some information about the health implications of plastics. Uh, my name is Pete Myers. I am Chief Scientist and Board Chair of Environmental Health Sciences, a science-based organization located in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I'm also on the I'm adjunct professor of chemistry at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. I've been working on these issues, specifically endocrine disruption, for the last 30 years. Uh, I've published many things in the scientific literature. My uh, work has been has received awards from the National Institute of Health, from the Endocrine Society, uh, and. Um, it's been quite a ride as we've experienced uh, slow growth of understanding of how vital these issues are for human health. I can add more if you want, but I can also just get into the show. So I'm here to help you understand some of the discoveries that have unfolded over the last 30 years um, about how plastics can uh, interfere with health, with human health. Um, this is an issue I've been working on for a long time, as I said at the outset, and uh, we've learned a lot over that time period. But I'm gonna begin with a very personal story, if that's okay. Please. Um, this is my granddaughter. <laughs> she was born uh, in January by cesarean section, prematurely, eight weeks early, weighing two and a half pounds. My daughter was rushed to the hospital in the middle of the night because she had developed a condition known as preeclampsia, which is malfunctioning in the placenta. It's a life-threatening situation that often forces an immediate cesarean, and that's exactly what happened there. Now, she spent two months in the neonative intensive care unit, and frankly, it was the plastics and other equipment in that unit that saved her life. No doubt about it, without that, she would not be alive today. But it turns out there's another side to the plastics role in this story. Um, how many of you remember the Paradise Fire in Paradise, California, November 2018, with 88 dead? Um, when those houses burned, plastics burned up and entered into the smoke that went from Paradise uh, to the Bay Area where my daughter was living. And you can see the brightest white plume there going from Paradise down to Oakland, California. Um, that happened literally when she was in her, the beginning of her third trimester. Um, and this is what the air in the Bay Area looked like during that period. But it's not the worst air quality that the Bay Area has experienced ever. And in addition to the usual particulate matter from vehicles, there were plastic fumes in it because of all that had been volatilized and burned in Paradise. Uh, when that happened, I immediately asked, what was the relationship between the smoke? I, I mean, when, when the early birth was forced, what was the relationship between the smoke and um, preeclampsia? And I quickly, within literally 15 minutes, found articles in the published literature that actually had been written some of my, by some of my colleagues in this field showing that smoke and specifically plastic fumes and plastic in the, in the mother are risk factors for preeclampsia. Now, as a scientist, I know one can never conclude from evidence like that that this caused her pre my daughter's preeclampsia, but it's entirely plausible. And so what does this leave us with? Um, here we've got these materials that are doing miraculous things for newborns, and yet they may be caused by the very materials that are saving their life. So how did we get in this predicament? What do we really know about human health risks of plastics? 
And what's, what's our way forward now that we understand there's a yin and there's a yang of plastics in our lives? Some of you may have seen this advertisement from the American Chemistry Council uh, a couple decades ago, uh, and earlier from DuPont, Better Living Through Chemistry. Plastics is an important part of your healthy diet. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. But that was the spirit of the decades, where the modern discoveries and inventions of chemistry were making our lives better. And it was unfolding the time when the science that I do hadn't even yet started. And so we didn't understand some of the risks that we were taking on by allowing, allowing these miraculous materials to penetrate every part of our lives. One of the, what we really didn't understand at the time in the 50s and 60s was that hormones guide the turning on and turning off of genes. And that's crucial for development. Genes are turned on or turned off by hormone signals. And it turns out that endocrine disrupting compounds, which is a science that I helped found uh, 30 years ago, I coined the term endocrine disruption at a scientific meeting in 1991. Endocrine disrupting compounds hack that signaling system and they get genes to turn on at the wrong time, or sometimes they prevent genes from turning on in the first place. And that, that type of interference, that hormone hacking, can have profound effects on what the fetus ultimately becomes, becomes. And it also actually can have effects throughout our lives. What makes plastic toxic? Well, one of the elements of plastic toxicity is the basic building block, the monomer of plastic. Sometimes those monomers are overtly toxic. Bisphenol A, for example, BPA and its brethren, the Ds, BPF, BPS, BP, whatever, are monomers that are overtly toxic because they bind with the estrogen receptor and other receptors and hack hormone signaling and alter gene behavior, sometimes at very awkward times. Um, so that's, that's how monomers can interfere. Uh, but it turns out to make plastic achieve the character, the material characteristics that chemical engineers need to make useful products, you have to add stuff to plastic. The best example there is that polyvinyl chloride, um, PVC plastic, is rigid if it's pure PVC. But you start adding to it compounds called phthalates. And as you up the percentage of phthalates from 0% to 40%, you go from rigid to the squeeziness of a rubber duck. Um, and parenthetically, let me strongly recommend that you all read a book called Slow Death by Rubber Duck, which is all about that dimension of plastics and PVCs and the additives, in this case, which are called phthalates. There are many uh, additives in addition to phthalates that are added to plastic, and they each have their own material and chemical characteristics, and many of them we know uh, are toxic and can lead to change gene expression. Um, then you've got what are called the Myers. not. Is this all making sense? Can I ask you a quick question? Um, sure. Before uh, any of these substances get into the marketplace, is there any kind of toxicity testing, for instance? Of, uh, uh, yes, uh, now there is for some of them. But when this was happening, when, for example, BPA in the 1950s came into widespread use, there was, there was none. And I will get to the strengths and the weaknesses of the testing protocols now, uh, later on in my talk. So the, the third source of toxicity in plastic are what are called non-intentionally added substances with the awkward acronym of NIAS. NIAS are um, reaction byproducts. When you make a plastic, uh, into it, its chains, when you chain together the monomer, causing a series of chemical reactions. And um, they don't all go to completion. Uh, sometimes there are intermediate products that hang around. Uh, sometimes there are, there are always, actually not sometimes, there are always impurities in the raw materials that, that lead to these, called these NIAS substances. And unfortunately, they are, there are thousands of them, and they vary from batch of plastic to batch of plastic, even with the same monomer, because they depend upon the contents of the, of the raw materials. 
Um, and unfortunately, while we know what some of them are, most of them we haven't even identified uh, chemically. We know that some of them and but are toxic. We don't know how many of them are toxic because it's very difficult to test for toxicity if you don't know what it is and can isolate it and then perform tests on it. The fourth source of toxicity, toxicity is that plastics actually absorb and absorb um, toxic compounds. Uh, chemicals adhere to the surfaces of plastic particles and then can be transported into fish, for example. Um, and they, they, chemicals can also be absorbed by plastic particles and also be transported up the food chain in that fashion. So here are these four different bottom line sources of toxicity in plastic. When I started working on this issue, endocrine disruption and plastics, and, other, and not all endocrine disruptors are plastics, but many of them are, uh, we were in the medical wilderness in the 19, early 1990s. But very soon, uh, science uh, started to uh, yield some really important results. This is a book by a noted historian of science, Shel Sheldon Krimsky, who wrote that, in this book, wrote that endocrine disruption was the, most, was the fastest scientific revolution he had ever witnessed in his entire history of reviewing uh, scientific progress. Um, in 1996, we wrote a book about this, which became a popular bestseller. Um, but the professionals weighed in soon thereafter. This is a report from the Endocrine Society. And the Endocrine Society is the world's authority on how hormones work. When you have a hormone-related disease, an endocrine-related disease like prostate cancer, breast cancer, diabetes, uh, infertility, you go to members of the Endocrine, Endocrine Society who try and help you treat what you're experiencing. But the Endocrine Society is also the home to the world's leading researchers on hormones, on endocrine action, and on endocrine disruption activities. And since the late 1990s, they have been leading the world in helping uh, science, scientific societies and scientists and medical professionals understand uh, what endocrine disruption is about. And a lot of the material that's emerged uh, on plastic toxicity via endocrine disruption has come from members of the endocrine society. Um, in 2012, this unexpected source of wisdom on endocrine disruptors uh, emerged, the CRO Forum. Now, CRO Forum is the chief risk officers forum of the reinsurance industry. And they did a review of the financial risks that their clients run. And their clients are insurance companies or insurance companies. Ins insurance companies insuring companies. Um, and they issued a report in 2012 recommending that their, uh, their clients, the insurance industry, review to what degree they're insuring companies that either manufacture or use endocrine disrupting compounds and lower their financial exposures because of, of that the manufacturer and use. Um, the World Health Organization in 2012 published a report along with the United Nations Environment Program concluding that endocrine disruption is a global public health threat. They did not mince words. Um, and they, uh, the Endocrine Society has published several additional uh, uh, statements on this now in, two, in 2019. And actually in 2016, four members of the Endocrine Society, including me on that third one, um, received a major public award for, from the Endocrine Society for outstanding public service because of our efforts to help members of the society and the public at large understand the health risks that this issue creates. Here's a list of just some of the endocrine-related diseases for which there is published scientific literature indicating endocrine disrupting compounds probably, not certainly, but probably play a role in the genesis of those conditions. These are today's epidemics, hormone-related cancers, infertility, diabetes, and the strength of the evidence varies from condition to condition, but frankly, it's going stronger and stronger for each of them with each year. One of the most dramatic of these is declines in sperm count. 
Um, some of you will see, have seen the press about this. Uh, most recently in 2017, when a major article was published by Dr. Shama Swan from Mount Sinai Hospital with her international colleagues, documenting a 50% decline in human sperm count over five decades, continuous decline in Western countries. And, and disturbingly, there's no sign of it slowing down. It's still, uh, the decline is still occurring at the same rate it was five decades ago when it first was detected. Um, while originally the data were mostly from the developed world, now there are, there is information coming in from the developing world, particularly in China, where over the last two decades, the declines are faster now than there were. And, and what's the relevance here to end this disruption and, um, and plastics? One of the key suspects in this whole issue are a, a collection of, a family of, of uh, plastic additives, phthalates, which I mentioned earlier. There is excellent, uh, really superb animal data showing that um, exposure to phthalates in the womb, uh, lower sperm count in adulthood, and also contribute to several other um, conditions, all of which are collectively known as the phthalate syndrome, or in people, as the testicular dysgenesis syndrome. And in people, while there's no certainty, because it's really hard to get certainty with people, there's multiple lines of evidence indicating that phthalates are contributing to lower sperm count in adulthood, testicular cancer in young adulthood, um, failure of the testes to descend properly uh, in, uh, at birth, and also birth defect of the penis, known as hypospadias. And this, these conditions all stem from the same, apparently, they, they appear to stem from the same causal mechanism, which is failures of some key cells in the developing male reproductive, reproductive tract to differentiate, differentiate properly at the right moment uh, in development. One is that exposure to EDCs, including through plastics, is globally ubiquitous. Not all the same in every place, but there's no place where, that hasn't experienced exposure, and it's growing. The second is that low doses matter a lot. Now, I'll give an example of that. The third is that events in the womb, like uh, failure of the male reproductive tract to differentiate properly, can lead to con health consequences that play out over the lifetime of the individual, such as testicular cancer in young males. Um, and lastly, to the point of the question that was asked uh, a few minutes ago, the testing methods that have been used to assess safety by the regulatory agencies are deeply flawed. Now, I will return to each of these points briefly. Um, exposure is ubiquitous. Um, there's really interesting research, for example, looking at phthalates, which I've mentioned several times. Phthalate is, uh, pollution worldwide, um, including in the depths of the Amazon forest, even though they're not used in the Amazon forest. This is French work. You see that uh, Nagori's field station button down there at the bottom. Even far into the forest, they were finding levels of phthalates in the cuticles of insects ants in this case, uh, that were sufficient to interfere with female reproductive, uh, reproductive success and also female uh, immune uh, function. Um, this is just one of hundreds of uh, thousands of papers that show exposure is ubiquitous. And of course, we know it from our own lives. We bring plastic into our homes via food packaging, via utensils. Uh, we actually bring uh, endocrine disrupting compounds in on computers and in couches and other common consumer products. And these contribute to human exposures very directly. The second uh, key issue in this revolution is that low doses matter a lot. Uh, some of you will have heard recently, in fact, in your neighbor state, Maine, uh, has been paying attention to this a lot over the last uh, year. The, the perchlorinated compounds, for example, on dairy farms, which are preventing farmers from selling uh, their produce and milk because the water is contaminated by sewage runoff. Um, Perfluorinated compounds are linked to many health, compound, uh, health outcomes, in, including cancers including obesity, including uh, poor immune system function, and other things. Um, 
perfluorinated compounds are incredibly persistent. That's why they picked up the, the uh, name uh, forever chemicals. These are used commonly in plastics. Um, just today, there was a press report uh, talking about perfluorinated compounds being found in artificial turf because it makes the, the grass of artificial turf print more uh, reliably as it's, as it's being created. And they're actually, they're discovering um, perfluorinated compound water adjacent, adjacent to discarded uh, turf um, that had been taken off fields where it had been used for five years before it wore out. Um, exposure to perfluorinated compounds is incredibly widespread. Uh, found in polar bears, found in people. Um, in the U.S., one of the principal sources of exposure is actually not plastics, although plastics contribute, uh, but it's, it's through the use of perfluorinated, perfluorinated compounds as flame retardants um, used uh, at airports. And so those are hot, it turned out to be hot spots. But it's another big source of exposure appears to be the standard practice using sewage sludge, which comes from sewage water, which has taken water in from the, the sewage system, which is contaminated by some of these other activities, and then spreading that sewage sludge on farmland and contaminating the farmland as a result. And if that's happening in Vermont today, you should be paying attention, and I'm sure it's happening. But low doses, uh, the, the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences uh, issued a conclusion a, a couple months ago is 0 0.1 parts per trillion, okay? We're used to hearing discussion of toxicology of parts per thousand or parts per, per million and sometimes parts per billion. Endocrine disrupting compounds often are active at parts per billion, and I'll mention this later. But in this case, 0.1 parts per tr trillion, according to the, the nation's top toxicologist, Linda Birnbaum. Um, events in the womb don't stay in the womb. I mentioned um, uh, the problem of testicular cancer in young men. Uh, here's another example. Um, this is work done with bisphenol A, which is the um, monomer used in polycarbonate plastic, and there are several other sources of exposure which I could get into, but that's a common one. This slide is a healthy male mouse that's about my age in mouse years, so well along. Uh, everything in this mouse, this is the control mouse, is normal. Um, it's got functional kidneys, the bladder is small but visible, and it's a male. Um, if that mouse had been exposed to bisphenol A, uh, 20 parts per billion to the mother, when the mother was pregnant with that male, this is what it would look like. This is what it did look like in, at my age in mouse years. The kidneys are no longer functional. The bladder literally will, like, would have exploded in the next few days if the animal had not been sacrificed. Um, it hasn't changed the sex, so it's still a male. But what's happened here is the following. The uh, urethra is the tube through which we all pee. It connects the bladder to the outside world. And the urethra in males passes through the prostate gland. And there's some key patches of tissue in the prostate that are hypersensitive to bisphenol A exposure. And what it does is it changes in that tissue how genes are turned on and off later in life. So right when the animal's born, unless you have some really sophisticated tools to measure uh, changes in gene expression, you won't be able to detect an effect. But if you wait until the animal is, again, my age in mouse years, that tissue has changed. And in fact, what happens is the urethra constricts at that point as the urethra is passing through the prostate and the animal can no longer pee. So its bladder explodes. This is a, a picture of four generations of a family. Um, great-grandmother, grandmother, mother, and granddaughter. And now there is strong evidence showing that not a, if, if grandma, if grandmother is the, excuse me, great-grandmother is the only person directly exposed, except for fetal exposure, uh, when, when she is pregnant with grandmother, 
the, the great granddaughter can be affected as well without changes in DNA sequence. It's not a mutation. The mechanism appears to be changes in how the genes are controlled. It's called transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. There's a lot of study on this. This, this version of that just came out um, this spring showing a really troubling variant on this. In essence, with this one, what happened was that the uh, animal, this is not a plastic substance, but another, but there's been a parallel finding in plastics. Uh, this is with glyphosate, which is part of Roundup. Um, the effects were not visible in, in the great-grandmother or the grandmother. They only began to appear and intensify in the granddaughter and the great-granddaughter. And I can guarantee you, thinking of tests used to examine the consequences, none of the regulatory agencies have ever even imagined the challenge of looking for these types of effects, these transgenerational effects. So that brings me to the issue of testing methods are deeply flawed. Um, some very sophisticated uh, European scientists just used a broad array of assays, tests, to look at a random sample of plastic products in their lives. And these were single-use plastics. They were uh, an assortment of different types of plastics. Um, and they found that three quarters of those products were toxic, looking at various types of toxicity. It, um, they didn't assume what they were going to find. They just did the test, and they found this. Uh, there's the, uh, the uh, reference, if you're interested in seeing it. For me, one of the most troubling findings was that one of the worst of the plastics tested was something called polylactic acid plastic, PLA, which is made out of cornstarch. It's one of those things that's marketed as a bio-based plastic. Um, and uh, what appears to be happening, and something we need to pay attention to, is that while the monomer, the polylactic acid, is probably safe, the additives that are used to make it do what the chemical engineers want it to do, the material characteristics they need, those, those additives are toxic. Somewhere in the mix is something toxic, which is making PLA plastic toxic. And a colleague of mine at Carnegie Mellon um, has recently concluded that the bioplastics are probably more in need of additives than the petroleum-based plastics for several different chemical reasons. And so we really have to be careful. We cannot assume that bio-based plastics are safe. So there's some real painful realizations that come out of watching this, this um, science unfold for 30 years. Um, one of the most important is that most chemicals have not been tested. But the tests that are used are flawed and outdated. There are some core assumptions that are really wrong, uh, that are underlying the uh, assumptions, uh, the structure of the tests. And the analyses that um, come out of those tests, uh, because there's so much riding on keeping products in the market, uh, they're probably manipulated, they often, not probably, they are manipulated to hide toxicological problems. Um, so I could go into each of these in depth. In terms of the tests being flawed and outdated, some of the regulatory tests date back to the 1930s. They are not using modern science from the, from the uh, 21st century. They're just not using them. Some of the laboratories, some of the regulatory uh, labs are starting to use those tools, but none of them are currently part of the regulatory process of, uh, of testing what is safe and what is not. I want to spend a fair amount of time um, on this issue of how flawed the assumptions that on, on which these tests are based are. And there are two key issues. One is something I'll call the Paracelsus problem. Uh, that Paracelsus was a physician and toxicologist literally from the 16th century who said basically the dose makes the poison and whose dictum justifies using high dose tests to make sure that even low doses are safe. And so I'll, I'll come back to that momentarily. The second profoundly failed assumption is now called the cocktail effect. Let me explain each of these in more detail. 
This is a photograph of uh, Fred Bomsall, Dr. Fred Bomsall, University of Missouri. Um, he, um, in 1994, he showed me a graph of his results that dragged the rug out from underneath all regulatory testing as far as I'm concerned. Here was the beginning of those results, and it was with a compound called diethyl silvestrol, which is a famous um, environmental estrogen, an endocrine disrupting compound. And what you see here is that the control had a prostate weight of a little bit over 40 milligrams. And when exposed to 200 parts per billion uh, nanograms per gram, the prostates were decreased. So that's standard toxicology. You tested high doses. Here's what Dr. Bomsall did, which is unusual. He started testing at lower and lower doses. At this, with this black curve, he found there's no difference between the 20 nanogram per gram exposure and the control. But beneath that, he found statistically significant differences in red between the controls and the experiments. So at low doses, the prostate size was bigger compared to the prostate size at high doses. Um, why is that important? Uh, it led to an epiphany for me, basically, led me to conclude, and Mom Saul and I have worked together on this ever since, you cannot use high-dose testing to predict low-dose results. Different things happen at low doses. In this case, just the opposite happens. The prostate size is expanded compared to uh, what happens at high doses. But let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, are, are low doses really low, what toxicologists call low doses? To them, a normal dose is parts per million. That's, that's the range of doses they normally work at, parts per million, parts per thousand, parts per million. These results are in parts per billion. And what's that mean? What is a part per billion? Well, some friends of mine, uh, colleagues, uh, developed this uh, this uh, description of a part per billion. It's, it's one pancake in a stack of pancake 4,000 miles high. <laughs> Sounds like it's a really low amount, doesn't it? But let's turn that around. If you have a drop of water that has one part per billion in it, one part per billion of bisphenol A in it, how many molecules of bisphenol A do you think will be in that one drop of water? Uh, trillions. <laughs> You're right, 265 trillion, 2.65 trillion. And uh, some of you will recall Avogadro's number. I won't go into the calculation right now, but bottom line, there are a billion times more molecules of water, but there's still 2.65 trillion molecules of BPA in that water. And when you have systems that work that are simulated by a small number of molecules, that's a lot of damage that can be caused. Here's a more visual example of the problems of high-dose testing. This is research, uh, research done by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, the one uh, uh, research scientist named Rita Newbold. Um, she exposed, well, she was working with a strain of mice, and the, the one on your right is the experimental mouse, and the one on your left is the control mouse. She determined that uh, their caloric intake rate as they grew up was the same. They also had the same activity levels. So what's the difference? The experimental mouse on the right was exposed to one part per billion at birth of a synthetic estrogen that altered how stem cells behave so that the mouse grew up with more fat cells. So that's what happens at low doses. What do you think happens at high doses? So what about 1,000 parts per billion? What would happen if that mouse had been exposed instead of one to 1,000 parts per billion? It would have been thin compared to the control animal. It would have lost weight. Different things happen at high doses than at low doses, and you can't predict from high dose experiments always what happens at low doses. I'm gonna give you one more example of this, which is in the form of a graph. And it's, it, the, the mathematical phenomenon here is called non-monotonicity, and I won't bore you with the details, but it's, the concept is very simple. Different things happen at high doses than happen at low doses, and high dose experiments do not predict low dose results. This is work with tamoxifen, which uh, by Wade Welshans at the University of Missouri, uh, where he exposed breast tumors in, in culture uh, to tamoxifen, which is a standard treatment 
treatment to control breast tumor growth. And you can see that the tamoxifen at parts per thousand did what tamoxifen is supposed to do. It suppressed the growth of the tumor compared to the control, okay? So those red asterisks mark where the treatment is different from the control. You can see for the first two high-dose treatments, it's different. The tumor's growth is suppressed. And then it's no longer different. And so what toxicologists do when they want to determine what, safe, what dose is safe is they look for the first dose where there is no difference between the control and the experimental, and they call that the no-observed adverse effect level, the NOEL. They don't do any more testing. Instead, what they do is they use a series of safety factors to estimate what's going to be safe. They divide by 10 because uh, animals aren't little people, and they divide by another 10 because kids aren't little adults, and they divide by another 10 because adults, because we all have variation. We're all different in the details of how well we deal with toxic contaminants. And then they call that the safe dose, the reference dose. That's literally how it's done with countless chemicals, how it's always been done by regulatory authorities everywhere in the world. Okay, did I hear a question? No, I'm just I grabbing okay. that it seems to be arbitrary uh, assumption. What, you mean that divide by 10, divide by 10, divide by 10? Absolutely, it's an arbitrary yeah. assumption. Yeah. Uh, totally. Uh, but it was decided that, well, if, if, if it doesn't have an effect at the NOEL, then a thousand times beneath the NOEL, clearly it's safe. Okay, that's the, the logic underlying it. But here's what Welshman found when he tested over the entire dose range. He found at the predicted safe level, the t growth of the tumor was enhanced just the opposite as what happens at high levels. And it turns out physicians know about this. This is, this is well known in endocrinology and in medicine because that's called the tamoxifen flare. It hurts. When women's titer in their blood of tamoxifen is in that range as they're beginning to get the dose, or if they stop taking it and it drops down in the, into that range, it hurts because the tumor is growing. Okay, so in this case, it's a very graphic, very clear demonstration of why the assumption that low dose effects can be predicted from high dose experiments is deeply flawed. And so what Welshman did was say, let's use the same assumption, uh, 10, 10, 10. Let's calculate the supposed true Noel from that. Uh, and then what's safe? Well, vanishingly low is safe, almost close to zero. And incidentally, this becomes interesting because uh, when women take tamoxifen, it's not all metabolized in their body. It goes out through their pee, it gets into the sewage system, it gets into drinking water. And so we need to know how far we have to go to regulate that. So this whole issue of non-monotonicity, low doses, um, can't be predicted with high dose experiments, it flies in the face of a standard assumption by regulatory testing that you can do that, that the dose makes the poison. That is true for a range of chemicals, but Linda Birnbaum, the head of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, writing an editorial about a paper that explored this issue, which I was a co-author of, um, concluded in Environmental Health Perspectives, the country's leading journal on these issues, that this sort of pattern should be the default assumption for endocrine disrupting compounds, including those found in plastics. Let me show you what that means. Here is the, a, a graph showing what the FDA estimates is the current safe level for in, in, ingesting bisphenol A, 50 micrograms per kilogram per day, okay? Just 50, okay? Um, they participated with a group of independent scientists in a study to try and test the, the legitimacy of that um, calculation. And the FDA's own data showed that there were low dose effects at 2.5 micrograms per kilogram per day, that green um, bar. The FDA concluded that because high doses of BPA didn't produce the same effects, the effects were biologically unrealistic. Therefore, they chose to ignore the low dose effects even though they were statistically significant. They used their assumption that high-dose tests can predict low-dose results to rule out their data, which doesn't sound as like science to me. 
So if you look at the low dose effects and you ask, what is the likely safe dose using these data? Well, they don't have a, every dose tested had an effect. So they don't have no observed adverse effect level. They have a low observed adverse effect level, um, the low L. And if you use the low L to begin to estimate what the current tolerable daily intake should be of BPA, there it is. It's 20,000 times lower than the current one. That's how mistaken the FDA may be in many of its estimates of what's safe and what's not for endocrine disrupting compounds. Um, they don't like these data. They argue against them. Um, the Endocrine Society, the world's leading professional association that's charged with thinking through the science for physicians and for scientists, agrees with this. In fact, it was the four members of the Endocrine Society who made this calculation. So we've got those two profoundly flawed assumptions, the Paracelsus problem. Very quickly, the cocktail effect. Uh, think of this guy, House. Uh, what's the first thing he asks you before he gives you a prescription? He asks you, what is your doctor already giving you? What other tests are you, what other drugs you're taking? But regulatory testing never has that. They always test chemicals one at a time. And there's lots of data showing that that's a deeply flawed assumption for establishing what's safe and what's not. Okay, so let's move to a different subject briefly. Um, that has to do with global plastic production in millions of tons. Here's what the industry, here's where we are now, uh, a little bit under uh, 400 million tons per year. Here's where we're headed by industry's own estimate, almost a, a quintupling over the next 30, uh, 30 years. So whatever problems we're having now with plastic, they're going to just continue to grow if this curve continues. Um, so I want to tell a brief story. How's my time doing? Uh, you're fine, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I mentioned that I published a book um, along with Theo Colborn and Diane Numanowski on these issues. And I, when it came out, I did a lot of public lecturing on it. Um, and I used to enjoy going to audiences of my friends, but also people who didn't agree with me. And one dark and stormy night, I was lecturing in Camden, New Jersey, um, to the Society of Plastics Engineers. In other words, the people who make this stuff and use it and figure out how to make products out of chemicals. Uh, the most assuredly, there were people angry in the room at what I was writing. Uh, and Camden, uh, I grew up in Baltimore, I, that's close enough to Camden, so I knew the rumors that that's where they used cement overshoes, uh, if they didn't agree with that. <laughs> so I gave the lecture. Uh, the usual happened, there were people in the audience who were prepared to ask me tough questions, and that's good. I, I learned from experiences like that, and I hope I, that the audience learned some of my responses. So. Um, that happened. Um, it was over. I survived. Uh, everyone left except for two big guys in the back of the room. And they started to walk towards me. And I literally became afraid. Um, and they walk up to me and they say, Dr. Myers, we like what you're doing. And I look at them and I say, hey, what? And they said, no, we like what you're doing. You're making certain commodities, plastics, unsellable in the market. And we've got the replacements, and we're going to make a lot of money. And I never thought of it that way. But it turns out, for the last 10 years, I've worked to help chemists make money by using the science that's come out of this field to design safer materials, because there's now a big market for that billions of dollars in sales. You go through any drugstore and you see products labeled BPA-free. That's because of this science, because moms don't want to expose their kids to endocrine-disrupting plastics. Um, so I, I took that as a mandate uh, and began to work with chemists to help them understand the science and help them design safer materials. And it, it, it's been a really interesting part of this journey. You remember the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle? 
at least one of those has a profound flaw to it. The, the recycle, we're all learning how inconsequential the effect of recycling is on plastics. Less than 9% recycled and less now, given China's uh, decisions and policies, not only in China, but increasingly in Southeast Asia, they're not gonna take our junk anymore. Um, I think it's time to acknowledge that, um, as a colleague of mine, Jane Munka, has stated, recycling is really the fig leaf of rampant consumerism. It gives, we, we do it, we think that's all we have to do, and we just continue our lifestyles as they have been. Um, recycling doesn't search, doesn't scratch the surface of this problem. Um, so we can't pretend that it's, it's gonna solve it. The odds against us today are staggering. They're not impossible. And I would propose that there are at least three essential components, the new three R's, at moving forward. One is, is redesign. As I mentioned, we understand so much more chemistry and, and molecular biology and the mechanisms of what causes things to be toxic than we did before. Why not work with the chemists? to make safer products and, and do the testing before they even get to the market. Turns out it's economically efficient because then they avoid investing a lot of money in a product that ultimately they have to run off the market. So redesign. A second is reform. Let's use modern science, 21st century science, to reform how those tests are run that, ask, that determine what's safe and what's not. We know, again, we know so much more than we used to. We can do it much better. We knew, but we need to replace the current tools with 21st century science. Um, and, and lastly, all this new science and public interest in it gives us, us a chance to recharge the energy levels of people trying to make these changes, trying to support um, the reform of regulatory actions, reform of, of how decisions about what's safe and what's not are made, and to provide market incentives to chemists who are using this science to redesign their products. So we can, we can do that. Um, actually, Europe, I hate to say, is much farther ahead of us on this. Um, some of you know that, uh, may, may know that uh, Europe takes endocrine disruption very seriously. Just before dissolving in April uh, uh, and going into the 2019 election fight, the European Parliament voted on a resolution 447 to 14 to encourage the European Council to stop twiddling their thumbs on this and adopt the policies recommended by 21st century science, including especially the Endocrine Society. Um, and uh, the new president of the European Council, who's a physician who just took office a couple of months ago, has made endocrine disruption one of her, her key points of reform. So we think we're gonna see even faster progress there than it's been happening here. Um, uh, although I, I don't underestimate the power of the market uh, to um, cause significant change, but at the same time, we shouldn't force mothers to be chemical engineers to have all that knowledge to go shopping for their kids. And speaking of their kids, there's Sierra again, my, my granddaughter. She's now over 15 pounds. She's not out of the woods yet, but things are looking a lot better than they were uh, in January. So what about the toxicity of plastics? Well, frankly, it's a lot worse than we imagined 30 years ago. It's contributing to a wide range of epidemics. We don't know how much the microplastics issue is contributing to that. We already know that the chemical uh, things that are in plastics are contributing. Um, and we need, know that we need to reduce our plastic burden and redesign it chemically. That's gonna help solve the plastic problems that we know about. And will also, I think, reduce the potential harm of future microplastics as that, that frightening graph of projected uh, plastic growth uh, goes forward. I think I certainly am afraid that the plastic industry will continue to ignore the unintended consequences of their innovations. They've done it over and over. Um, but the odds against us reversing these mistakes, while daunting, are not impossible. The solutions are definitely there. 
Uh, they've just been um, on the, they've just been slow in gaining momentum, which I believe is well along now and will help change this, this picture significantly. What role does the Vermont Assembly want to play? I don't know, but I'd sure be happy to uh, be able to help. Um, but let's just make sure that you do it without letting today's solutions become tomorrow's problems. And with that, um, let me recommend a free newsletter that we publish every week on Mondays, which is an aggregation of news about plastic from around the world. Um, it's called Into the Plasticine. Um, it's an aggregation of, of news and also some science that's coming out. Um, I originally thought, uh, or I, I, I thought of this name, Into the Plasticine, um, and finally went with it, although I must admit I debated calling it in, just into the obscene, which also seems appropriate. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions from the... Um, and ubiquitously. So the question is, are they small enough at this point to... I can't remember the real word, but to pass from, for instance, our digestive system through the wall and into our into our bloodstream, um, are they small enough to get from the bloodstream into uh, in our lungs into into the alveoli, for instance? How what's happening there? So I, I attended a, a global health summit last week in Amsterdam, where there was some new science presented by people specifically studying microplastics. The Danish excuse me, the Dutch uh, National Science Foundation has put a couple million dollars into eight studies asking questions exactly like that. And the answer is yes, they are penetrating into the placenta. They're pe penetrating into the brain. They're getting into the alveoli. Um, we don't know, and it was stated repeatedly, we don't know what the toxicological consequences of that penetration are. Um, it may not be enough yet to become more important than the chemicals that are already getting in there. The chemicals are already there, okay? Um, it may be that as, even if they aren't, uh, there isn't enough of that there already, the graph of future production of plastic is really disquieting because it's only gonna get worse. Um, I would say that but, um, if we deal with the chemical problem and we, uh, we deal with most of the problems of microplastics and nanoplastic, except for the asbestos-like effects where it's more of a physical uh, ir irritation, mesothelioma, et cetera, than a toxic effect. Um, we, we, the, the uniform this, uh, conclusion by the scientists who are doing the work funded by the Dutch now um, after just literally a few months of doing the study is bottom line, yes, they're in places we don't want them to be, but we don't know yet what the health consequences are. Thank you very much. Um, along those same lines, um, we had some testimony last uh, winter about um, micro or nanoplastics carrying other things. So they end up being, I think they were called like a raft from the environment. Uh, pick things up and then transport them. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, actually I mentioned that as one of the sources of plastic toxicity where I think that adsorb to the surface of the nanoparticles or microparticles or they absorb, they are absorbed by the particle itself and go into the interior. There were several discussions of that at the meeting last week in, in Amsterdam. Um, for me, the most interesting one was the, the bacteria that accumulate on the surface of microplastics that um, are bacteria that often are implicated in human uh, epidemics. Um, again, we don't know the scale at which it's happening today, but as you, again, you look at that exponential growth of plastic production, where we are today, and we're, <laughs> we're already asking these questions today, what's gonna be like in 30 years when there's five-fold greater production? Uh, and we, we need to be asking that question now in order to solve it today so it doesn't only continue to get worse. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, any other questions from the, the committee? 
All right, well, thank you again for um, helping walk us through the, the health impacts and for your presentation. And um, if we have any follow-up questions, we will reach out to you. Please do. I'm here in Charlottesville, Virginia. All right. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have some time left, but I figured actually that this would be our, our last presentation we, uh, for today. And we did some work on outlining uh, elements in the report and uh, more questions on how ERP might be developed. We've had some requests from manufacturers or um, companies that are, you know, addressing plastics in their business uh, to provide us with more information. We know that, uh, you know, I had, and I had said to one person who was asking to be a witness that we're not, uh, there's nothing about this bill that impugns anybody and says, oh, we don't think you're paying attention to plastic. And uh, it just says, we've learned enough to know that we need to pay more attention to plastic. And so, um, There'll be a chance for some people involved in using plastics, et cetera, like today, to share more about what they're they're doing at that next meeting. Um, but I, you know, I always try to come back to the question of um, uh, what questions do people on the committee have, and um, and then we can match that up with. And is there anyone from whom you would really make sure that we hear? So let me pause there, and it's, those are real questions. Um, are there questions you have as you think about where we're going that you'd like us to get to, and, or, and or are there people that you say, oh yeah, well, I think we should hear from this organization or that particular person? I, I feel unclear on the question that I keep going back to of whether we should expand the bottom of the bill or not. And I feel unclear that some people say that the recycling places can't take it, and some people can. And then unclear, it doesn't, I want to make sure that we address the increase in, and not, maybe not expansion, but increase in the, the returns. And as the restaurant owner, um, if there's some facts on my ballpark guess is restaurants don't go to redemption. And so that's why I keep going back to. Yeah, sorry, I didn't quite hear what you said. Restaurants don't. We don't. We don't truck our. We don't put our cans in the trunk of a car and bring it to. Mm -hmm. We do. Some of us do with liquor bottles because they're fifteen cents, and so that's why I keep going back to. Is that low hanging fruit? Because a lot of what I'm hearing, it seems like, we aren't doing what we already do. What we already have in place, we're not doing and so my question is is do we need more money for marketing and publicity to so people know what we already have in place or do we need better systems for what we already have in place instead of all go I'm not saying don't expand right. but it just seems like there's some low hanging fruit there. So so even if we're not expanding the bottle bill, right. how to increase the effectiveness of the bottle bill. Yes. Okay. Um, and I know that you know uh, one, one of the things that people have said is we talked about it, I think a couple of meetings ago or if you were setting the, the nickel today and you wanted to adjust for inflation from 1972 I guess it was when we started or something like that you it would be 32 cents a bottle so that has not kept pace and maybe that has an impact on it but all right uh, Aaron. I'll go down. Um, on that too, I would love to understand what's not working in the current materials management plan where we're at 36 percent. I think we've made strides, but what's what's keeping us from getting to our goal, right? So can we fix the current system or are there improvements that we can make? Kathy, do you have, I'm, I'm guessing, since you work in this field steadily, yeah. and maybe you're the, the solid weight districts too, um, do you have thoughts about that last question? I mean, not for now, but. For right, I think a lot of it is the, um, the, the universe that you're looking at. If we're just looking at blue bin materials, 
we're at 72 percent but there's a lot of a lot of things that we touch during our day that aren't recyclable that um, get disposed and so remember that first presentation um, of the 155,000 tons of single-use products um, only half of that half of that is recyclable or compostable or, or compost, yeah, yeah. yeah so so there's a chunk of that that we couldn't right we shouldn't rightfully put it in the blue bin so it'll dump things up at the right. Um, other folks, other questions? Um, so I'm still struggling with like what the goal is. I know we had some discussion about different elements that we're going to consider with the report. Um, one thing that I'll suggest, straight out of the California legislation, the first goal in that bill is to have packaging 100% recyclable, compostable, or reusable, right? Um, and there was some general agreement around that goal. So I don't know if we're, we are trying to create a goal through this process or just evaluate a bunch of different structures. Uh, but I'd be interested because that would potentially get towards the idea of, OK, if we agree on a definition of recyclable and, and manufacturers are committed to recyclability, compostability, reusability, does that, to your point, 50% is not even recyclable right now, right? That's the concern. So. Does that frame it in a different way where we're not just talking about these massive systems that we're trying to evaluate and create? Is there a goal that we can work on and then work on the regular, you know, what the what, what pieces fit under that? Because right now it just seems like we're looking at all these different systems. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I might be able to provide a little bit of clarification on the bottle bill system because I was at that bottle bill stakeholder meeting last week and I wasn't really aware of what's wrong with that system. Um, so from what I can understand, um, it's not only the amount of source that are causing the issue, is that co-mingling is mandatory at this point and that will require a legislative change in order to do that. So only the, some of the bigger brands like Coke, Pepsi are part of the Vermont commingling agreement where everything can be mixed together and some of the other smaller brands have to be sorted separately and a lot of these redemption centers don't have the space to handle more volume. Um, and then the amount of fraud into the system from not only New Hampshire but that doesn't have a bottle bill that people from New Hampshire bring their material and try to return it here. The amount of online sales have increased from buying things on Amazon or directly from you know, Sam's Club. They're getting it shipped right to their home, and that nickel isn't being calculated into the system. So there's some accounting issues with the current system that all need to be addressed. And I don't know if that's all legislatively or some that need to be addressed before expansion could even be really considered possible. Um, yeah, so um, backing up to an hour or so ago, I, I mentioned the, the deferred submission of the Ontario marriage, if you will, between um, container deposits and extended producer responsibility. And as I read that, it, it actually solved a bunch of the concerns that, that we have currently around um, our present bottle bill as we know it, how, how um, the, you know, the sorting issues and, 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 and so on. Um, so I really think that that's something that this committee ought to learn more about um, and, and presentation by VPIRG of that might be might be very useful for us if we're going to if to help us decide whether we you know this is you know this is something we want to do or might recommend in the future or what have you or just cast aside the other thing going back um, to our charge and I think a thing that we aren't we aren't looking at right now but is very much included in our charge is film plastics 
and film plastics um, um, did play a role in the bill until we, we gave them away um, appropriately, um, such as um, dry cleaning. Bags isn't really a good word, but dry cleaning film plastics. Um, they're not, they're, dry cleaners aren't the villains here. There aren't any villains. It's just that we've got this material. Um, and uh, shrink wrap, uh, another huge film plastic, uh, probably dwarfing dry cleaning <laughs> film plastic. And maybe dwarfing that is the agricultural film plastics. And we just don't. We, 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 I think we need information about that, and, and this group needs to make recommendations about film plastics in general, um, and and what to do, what to do about them. So I think we need we need um, we need a presentation about that. I think we all recognize at some point present school has got to stop, and we got to start <laughs> making some decisions. But I think this is a major category. And, and um, thinking agricultural film plastics and the explosion of, of, um, of hemp, we now have miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of new agricultural film plastic being stretched out 18 inches apart in, all, you know, in our, in our, um, in our agricultural land brand new this year, and that's going to even get greater. And what's going to happen to all that black plastic? So that's my pitch. We'll be on a hook now. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of where we'll end up, I mean, I don't know precisely where we'll end up, but I mean, in terms of our job, it's to um, report out, and we don't have to necessarily have come not expecting that we I like a vote and we all come to consensus. Yes, A is the thing we most recommend, and B is second place, and C is third, et cetera. I think uh, rather than have to prioritize everything, we can uh, sort things out and sort of outline our understanding of the challenges rather than necessarily, if we have recommendations, certainly, you know, that'd be stuff we could include, but I don't think we have to solve the plastics challenge more than describe it well and help tee up uh, additional future uh, work on the issue. You know, I think when we were putting together the working group, it wasn't for the idea that in six meetings we would figure it all out and make solutions, but that we would take in the whole topic and try to clarify what elements are there to, to work on and help uh, the coming session then prioritize work in those areas. So it's feeling like it's, um, I don't want people feeling bummed out that you haven't <laughs> thought about this in three weeks and solved the plastics crisis yet. That's <laughs> uh, probably work to come. So great. So for each thing that people just went through, thank you. Um, I'm making a list and we'll between now and next meeting. Uh, tune up the agenda. And of course, always, I'll just say this one again too, is there's anyone you would like to hear from. You know, we're open to hearing from everyone. We want to make sure we have full, fair, and balanced testimony. Um, so always make sure that you um, understand what we'll add people to the agenda for. Um, one quick thing on Representative McCullough is I think we could probably invite the consultant who wrote that Ontario report themselves to call in. Um, that might be a better way to get the answer directly. Um, so happy to look into trying to connect with them. Um, on process, I'm wondering if, I mean, it sounded like um, ANR has some good thinking on some specific ideas. Um, I'm wondering if like people should come back next meeting, if there's maybe still some learning, but have, you know, write up a brief pitch of <laughs> some of the ideas. We actually have something to start working from on paper. So if different people have specific proposals, um, that they'd like the group to think about that might go into kind of the, and if we get to the report of having, you know, laying out some of the like benefits and maybe concerns the legislature could think about, um, you know, if that's as far as this group's going to get. Um, but I think that might help us 
have something tangible to work on. It does seem like getting to the question of what are we trying to achieve, which maybe we have time to discuss now, like so we all have clarity of the solutions are putting on the table towards this shared goal um, and vision and like the scope of what we're talking about. Are we staying siloed in single use products or are we, like Aaron suggested, looking at maybe a, a broader thing? Um, so if we had clarity, so we would have exactly to focus any ideas we might want to okay. put forward. Well, thank you. Uh, so the, uh, I mean, I think one thing that might be helpful to all of us is uh, now that we're three meetings in and we've had a fair amount of testimony uh, would be um, to your point of uh, identifying one or two things, things, uh, you know, and just writing out a paragraph on one or two things, you know, so uh, distilling it down of, of the things you've heard, what is, what seems particularly important, um, and I think and then if, so we meet uh, two weeks from today. If people could do that, uh, one, pick your top, whatever it is, up to three, two, something like that. Pick um, your top things and just state in a paragraph or so what it is you're seeing as a problem and uh, maybe a way that you're thinking about either addressing that or if you want to ask, uh, if we need testimony to help dig into that further, like it's still an open question. But I think it's probably a good time to be sort of turning the corner and starting to say, here's, for me, top three things, um, challenges to work on, and here's here ways that I would think we might want to propose working on them. Um, and then if we ask people to send them into Mike Farron by a week from this uh, Friday. Sorry, I'm going to catch up here in the calendar. Uh, maybe someone's already there. 18th. Um, and then we can redistribute them to the whole group. So that I would ask people to send them in by the 18th. And then on that uh, might by the end of, by close of business on the 18th, if you can send out to everyone in the group all the comments, proposals, notes, whatever we're calling it, you receive. That way people can read through them and uh, will help key us up, put us in a better spot for starting to make some decisions about what's in and what's out for the, the final meetings. Because as I was saying, uh, four weeks from today, we'll, we need to be moving towards having uh, a draft, starting to the drafting process, so that we can take further testimony, clarify through things, and uh, and edit as a group what we have as a document. So on the 18th of October at 4 p.m., I will send you a copy paste of document that has everyone's paragraphs that have been turned in by that point. Okay, great. Yes. We have we have multiple requests to testify the next week. Okay. I'm sorry. You have multiple requests to testify at the next meeting. Oh. Mike and I have received six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Eight. Yes. Okay. Um, can you briefly read off what they are? So we'll have a sense of good people are knocking on the door. I'll go just in the order of the mess on the table. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, can't go chronologically at request. So Kevin uh, Cannon, the executive director of PMA, um, project, uh, product management alliance, uh, oh, they say he has a long paragraph. Um, I'm sorry, this is the, the this is their position on okay. this committee. So I'll send that differently. That's something different. I'm sorry. Todd Booten, general manager of Barrel Distribu Distributing Corporation, uh, testify on behalf of the Vermont Wholesale Beverage Association at the next meeting, uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, we have Katie Riley of the Consumer Technology Association, Trade Association for Consumer Electronics, be scheduled for next meeting. Um, BPI get involved with this working group. 
the North America's leading certifier of compostable uh, packaging, and that was Rhodes Yep Yepsen. Um, Mr. Langdon, who's the British Columbia EPR person who couldn't make today's, said he can make next week, our next meeting, 12.30 or 1 p.m. Um, Dylan De Thomas with the Recycling <coughs> Partnership um, would like to testify. Rachel Caprielian, Caprielian from McDonald's, who is here and works with some, uh, she's working with somebody here, but she, she would like to testify at the next meeting later, if possible. And then we had um, Chaz Miller uh, also requested uh, uh, through Mr. Hackman to testify. Okay. And we have not scheduled our sixth meeting yet, so I'd like to have that nailed down before we leave today. Too. Our sixth meeting? Our final meeting. Okay, all right. So let's, so uh, I'll work with Michael and Mike on the scheduling of the witnesses we've invited. Um, Claire, didn't you ask to speak next time? Uh, yes, and but Todd Bowden, who's the general manager of Feral Distributing, is going to testify on behalf of the association. Okay. And he is our witness. Okay. Just want to make sure we are leaving you out. Thank you. Um, so let's look ahead at the calendar. Can you remind us of the, yes, the um, here. So November dates? Our, yep, our next meeting is here in room 10, same time, 12.30 to 4, on the 22nd of October, so two weeks from today. Yep. The meeting after that is November 12th, and that's the same time, 12.30 to 4, and that will be in the tax department building, 133 State Street. On the fourth floor is called the boardroom. That's where we'll be because this building most likely will still be shut down. And then we have two options for the final meeting. Well, we've done that, but the two next logical options that follow our two week stint. We can do November 26th, which is the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. This room is available. Or the week after that, December 3rd, this room is available. Um, how are people, what's people's availability for Thanksgiving? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, okay. If there's um, a choice. Uh, what is our official due date for the report? 12 1 or 12 15? 12 1, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, show of hands, who would prefer 1126? Who would prefer 12-3? I already know for a few people. One, two, three. I think it's also better for Jen. 12-3. Pardon me? 12-3 would be better for Jennifer. Okay. So, uh, let's do 12-3. And uh, that'll also add a little time for additional drafting prior to that meeting. And then, by then we should have a, you know, basically we'll come into a, to the final report to be going through and we can be tuning um, a final draft report, okay. Do you want that to be 12.30 before saying in this room? Yes, please. Okay, I'll reserve it and send it out. 12.30 here, okay, okay, great. Oh, got you. I got you. All right. So, thank you. I mean, I think that we have plenty of people to hear from. Um, let's all do a little thinking on paper and share that with one another. And that'll help us um, start to do the sorting. What, what, we're, what we've heard about, but are going to exclude because we can't do all things in every report. Um, and then we have witnesses lined up and we'll have some discussion time based on, so we'll have a group of witnesses, I think that will be on the shorter side uh, for the testimony we're gonna hear and uh, to leave us with ample time to use what everyone's contributed uh, in writing on the 18th. Okay, great. Anything else that we haven't touched on? Issues, logistics? 
Okay, so uh, we're finishing eleven minutes early. That's always a good sign. Don't like to finish late. So thank you very much, everybody.